Hello everyone, uh, good morning and thanks for coming to the Linnaean Society's first student conference. Uh, I hope there will be many more. Uh, we have quite a busy program today so I, I won't take too much time uh, with this introduction. My name is Joe um, and this is Liam. so we've organised this together. Uh, I'm the events manager. I'm the education. She's the. Sorry, I my job. Yeah, I'm the education manager here. And, I'm the events manager. There we go. Um, the Linnaean Society is a famous uh, venue for where scientists have come to discuss their own research amongst themselves. But in modern times, we're looking for more scientists who can discuss it with the public, without making the public feel um, out of their depth on one hand, but. Um, more patronised on the other. So this conference challenges young researchers not only on their content but also on their delivery. We're looking for researchers who can share their knowledge broadly and effectively and pitch at a level that the general public can understand. So while you're listening today, I hope you can appreciate the bravery it takes to stand on this platform and talk to a room full of people about something you've been focused on for se several years and mainly discussed amongst knowledgeable peers. Our judges are dotted around um, and they'll be watching throughout the day today, seeing if our speakers are clear and confident, engaging and effective, and if their research has been made relevant to everyone. In the library, there are also a set of posters uh, created by a different group of researchers. And these posters are a gateway into the years of research um, that they have done. And they should provide an engaging snapshot into the past, present and future of their projects. Um, we'll also be taking an audience vote, so everyone's got one of these ballot papers. Um, there's a box, so what you can do is label your favourite talk and poster, so each of the speakers has a number attached to them, which is in the programme, and the box will be in the library. Um, yeah, so you can place your slip at the end of the day into the voting box. Can everyone hear me? Great. Uh, okay. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm a PhD student from the University of Edinburgh, funded by the Scottish Graduate School of Arts and Humanities. And I'm going to be talking to you today about Werner's Nomenclature of Colours, a colour manual from the early 19th century that was used to identify and communicate the colours of the natural world. To begin with, I'd like to say that I'm not a scientist. I studied literature and creative writing, and I came to this book at first through its language. As a writer, I'm always interested in the workings of language, with how we select, curate, order, and manipulate words to enable us to say what we really mean, to capture sights, sounds, smells, feelings, and thoughts as accurately as possible basically to translate things into words. And colour is one of the trickiest aspects of this. It lives on the edge of articulation, too easily changed by light and dark, or hot and cold, or wet and dry, and by emotion and memory and the sheer subjectivity of experience. But there are some disciplines where specificity of colour is absolutely key. And natural history is, of course, one of them. At the time of its publication, Werner's nomenclature of colours was the most successful attempt to pin colour down to language and create a standard vocabulary of colour for use across multiple disciplines, from botany and zoology to chemistry and morbid anatomy. This small, leather-bound volume was first published in 1814, with the second edition in 1821. As you can see, its pages are lined with thumbnail-sized, hand-painted squares of colour, each accompanied by a colour name, and an example from the animal, vegetable and mineral kingdoms on which that exact hue can be found. Its colours include orpiment orange, found on the neck ruff of the golden pheasant and the belly of the warty newt. There's reddish black, the colour on the, of the spots on the large wings of the tiger moth, and auricular purple, 
halfway down the page here, the exact hue of a blue bottle's egg. The list of colours in Werner's nomenclature was first published in 1774 by the German mineralogist Abraham Gottlob Werner in his book, A Treatise on the External Characters of Fossils. In his influential treatise, Werner proposed a system for the identification of rocks and minerals. He based his geological observations on external attributes, the most notable of which, he observed, was colour. Among the common generic characters of fossils, he wrote, the colour is the first which strikes the senses. So, in their first iteration, the colours in Werner's nomenclature started as stones. From his, assorted, from his own assorted suite of minerals, Werner compiled his list of 54 hues, with a description of each colour and the name of a mineral example of that hue. In the Linnaean tradition, Werner borrowed from the language of natural history to organise his, his list, splitting the eight principal colours, the genera, into 79 species. So white is the genus, and snow white is the specific species of white. Werner's nomenclature of colours concerned with creating a standard, replicable vocabulary of colour is the descendant of Abraham Werner's list. Its colours begin with the project of mineralogical identification and description, with colour as a means of classification. But in order to really fulfil this function, colour itself must be classified, dissected, and neatly boxed up. In 1814, Scottish artist Patrick Syme transformed Werner's list, extending his suite of colours to 108 and adding a coloured swatch to each. Syme was a prominent Edinburgh artist, exhibiting his flower and fruit paintings throughout his lifetime. In the annual Edinburgh exhibitions that took place from 1808, and at the Royal Academy in London. He was a well-known art master and a successful author, publishing two other books in the course of his lifetime, Practical Directions for Learning Flower Drawing in 1810 and A Treatise on British Songbirds in 1823. Syme's artistic skill was based on a keen understanding of the natural world, an understanding that was enriched by his activities as official artist to Edinburgh's Vernarian Natural History Society. Founded in 1808, the society was made up of geologists, anatomists, chemists, physicians, surgeons, botanists, and horticulturalists. Founded to improve the study of natural history in Scotland, the Vernarian was a society for all things animal, vegetable, and mineral. Its president was Robert Jameson, professor of natural history at the University of Edinburgh and keeper of its collection of natural history objects. Jameson had studied under Werner in Freiburg and had already published his own version of Werner's coloured list. Jameson showed Syme the value in Werner's system and together they widened its scope, adding written examples from the animal and vegetable kingdoms. They used specimens from the university's collections to match and mix each exact hue, like these chunks of obsidian, turquoise, and aquamarine, jasper, gypsum, and glistening basalt, held in the National Museum of Scotland's mineral collection. Syme and Jameson transformed Werner's list into a slim, portable object, perfect for fieldwork, and small enough to be carried round in the hand. With these revisions, Werner's colours read like a catalogue of contemporary scientific knowledge, collecting zoological, botanical, anatomical, and geographical discovery into its coloured columns. Velvet black is the black of black and red West Indian peas. Blackish green is found on the dark streaks on the leaves of cayenne pepper and verdigris green on the tail of the small, long-tailed green parrot. The colours make journeys across continents or across the surface of the body with flesh red and hair brown. They travel through it with arterial blood red and gallstone yellow. 
Syme's appropriation of Werner's colours made the nomenclature extremely popular with contemporary naturalists, the most famous being Charles Darwin, who carried a second edition of the book with him on the voyage of the HMS Beagle, now held at, university, at uh, Cambridge University Library. In 1831, as the Beagle made its way across the wind-washed Atlantic, Darwin compiled a catalogue of observations, filling notebooks with detailed Latinate descriptions. He recorded the sights, sounds, smells, and colours of the voyage in notes both zoological and geological, familiar and strange. Off the Patagonian coast, Darwin watched a shark pulled from the August sea, its gaze lustrous and its pupil parrot green. Body bluish gray, he wrote, above with rather blackish tinge beneath much white. Its eye was the most beautiful thing I ever saw. Pupil, pale verdigris green, but with luster of a jewel, appearing like a sapphire or beryl. Darwin picked his colors straight from the pages of Syme's book, leaning on their neatness to describe the living pigments he encountered, like the chromatic undulations of the chameleon-like cuttlefish rippling with a French gray with numerous minute spots of bright yellow and clouds varying in tint between hyacinth red and chestnut brown, continually passing over its body. Vivid and detailed, Darwin's descriptions guard against the fading of pigment and the dulling of memory. In Port Famine, Darwin sampled dappled globes of sweet-tasting South American fungus, honeycombed with ochre yellow and Dutch orange. A bristling porcupine fish oozed a fine, carmine red fibrous secretion from its belly, staining paper and ivory a vivid red. He watched flocks of black skimmer birds with bright flashing bills and vermilion red legs, and the darting movements of a lizard, the most beautiful I have ever seen, he wrote, bright emerald green. Eventually, Darwin's pen was so used to Werner's terms that it cut them down to handy abbreviations. Art blood R, liver B, wax Y. Darwin's notes from the voyage were accompanied by specimens, dried or skinned, and those preserved in spirits, particularly the fishes. Their limp forms were folded into spirit-filled jars and shipped home. By the time they reached England, the fish's bright colors had pickled away replaced by sepia browns and beasters. In Cambridge, Darwin's colleague, the Reverend Lennon Jennings, pored over Darwin's handwritten notes and matched each numbered description to a small ticket of tin affixed to each specimen. Jennings described each fish using his own copy of Werner's nomenclature, noting that a comparison was always made with the book in hand, previous to the exact color in any case being noted. Before setting sail on the Beagle, Darwin also wrote to his colleague, John Henslow, instructing him to keep Syme on colors in your mind. Darwin knew that his descriptions would only be fully comprehensible with their leather-bound key kept close, with the book to hand or in mind. For Darwin's words to be translated back into their true colors, they had to be made to pass once more across the pages of Syme's book. But Darwin wasn't the only naturalist to make use of Werner's nomenclature of colors. Its terms appear in a multitude of 19th century journals, magazines, letters, and published scientific works. In the zoological appendix to Captain Parry's journal of the second voyage in search of the Northwest Passage, the naturalist John Richardson writes, the colors used in the descriptions are to be found in an excellent little work entitled Werner's Nomenclature of Colors by Patrick Syme, now frequently referred to by several eminent naturalists and comparative anatomists of this country. Indeed, Richardson found Syme's oil green in the eggs of the flat-billed filarope, covered with irregular spots of dark umber brown. In the second volume of his Flora of North America, published in 1822, the American botanist, William Barton, attempted to recreate the colors in Syme's book for his own botanical plates. But he found he was unable to do so using the common colors in use and suggested that Syme's swatches might have been mixed 
using traces of the minerals they were matched to. Instead, he used Syme's terms to describe the intricate quirks of North American plant life. Added to its contemporary use, the book provided a model for subsequent color manuals. In particular, ornithologist Robert Ridgway's A Nomenclature of Colors for Naturalists, published in 1886. In his introduction, Ridgway identifies Werner's nomenclature of colors as being, despite the intervening decades, the latest publication of its kind to successfully provide a means for naturalists to identify and to describe the rich kaleidoscope of shades and tints on display in the natural world. The success of Werner's nomenclature lies in its ability to condense experience into a gesture of pointing, either physically or verbally. It acts as a device for translation, like a dictionary, bilingual between color and words. Syme's colors filter experiences, offering a lens through which the senses interpret the moment of seeing and through which someone else might be made to see the same. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Um, as Joe's just said, my name's Fiona and I'm a third year PhD student at Oxford University based in the Department of Zoology. And just before I begin, I'd like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to be speaking here. I've been a member of uh, the Linnaean Society as a student for the last nine years or so and been in this room many times, but never on this side. Um, so that's fantastic and doubly nice to be able to be here talking to you a bit about my PhD research, which focuses on penguin conservation in the Southern Ocean and how we can achieve this on a large scale, both temporally and spatially. And I'm mainly going to be talking to you about the new methods that we're using in order to monitor penguins effectively. So without further ado, I promise you that I don't make a habit of filling my slides with fairly boring looking black and white graphs, but I felt that this was an important place to begin because it really underpins the reason why we carry out this type of research. This is a graph showing the population trend of the world's monitored seabirds over the second half of the last century and just into the 21st century. And you really don't need to be an expert in the field to see that a decline from here to here is not a good thing. And as conservation biologists, what we ultimately want to be able to do is to reverse this trend. And if not do that, at least halt it or stabilize it. In order to do this, however, we need to get a really good handle on the underlying mechanisms behind this change. What are the threats that the birds are facing and how can we do something about that? So when I said the word seabird, you might have thought of an albatross or a petrel soaring over the waves or maybe a seagull down in Brighton stealing your chips. But of course, the, the, per, uh, the, group, of peng, uh, the group of seabirds that I study um, are the penguins, and they are very much a seabird in their truest sense. So where do these fit into this overall trend of decline in the population that I just showed you? Well, I thought it would be interesting just to go onto the IUCN website, the IUCN being the organization which categorizes species all over the planet according to their vulnerability. And if you go on there and just tap in penguin into the search engine, then this is the first page of results that will come up. Two things immediately strike you here. Firstly, that many species are indeed in decline but also that the story isn't quite as simple as this. It's not all doom and gloom with everything in decline, and this makes sense really if we think about it, because there are 18 different species of penguins distributed all over the Southern Hemisphere, from the forests of New Zealand to beaches on South Africa, and they're not all exposed to the same threats, and they're not all going to be responding in the same way. However, if we go down into the Southern Ocean and meet the penguins that I most frequently encounter, you'll still see that we have some different things going on. It's again not a simple story, even when they're being exposed to similar threats. And this is because, of course, species are individual, they respond in different ways. The Adeli that you see on the right-hand side is very susceptible to changes in sea ice. It really needs the sea ice to do well. And that means in East Antarctica, where we're actually seeing um, an increase in some of the sea ice, the penguins are doing quite well, so that all makes sense. 
The Gen 2s, on the other hand, are much more generalist species and can cope a little bit better when there are changes. But despite all of the technology that we have nowadays, we're still not 100% sure what's going on with the colonies. So we really need some very good monitoring, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about. I work particularly on uh, these three species, the Gen 2, Chinstrap, and Adeli. And I could not do a talk at the Linnaean Society without giving you their proper name. So while these are commonly called the brush tail penguins because of this cute little tail that they have, um, they are the Pygoscelis family. Um, and uh, they live on the coastal regions of Antarctica and are about this big. So quite, not quite as big as the emperors that you might be more used to seeing. So what are the threats that these are facing? What are we most worried about? The first of them is climate change. And this is something that everybody in this room is going to be familiar with. You probably also know that the Antarctic Peninsula is one of the most rapidly warming places on the entire planet. And this has a number of implications. When we're talking about climate change, we don't just mean a greater number of warm days in the year. We're also talking about increasing storm frequency, um, increased precipitation in the form of rain rather than snow. And this can be really dangerous for small chicks, which are susceptible to hypothermia. It also means changes in the distribution of sea ice and in um, the distribution of their food resources, maybe in the peak timing of those resources. And that brings me on nicely to the second threat, which is fishing activity. You might not have heard of the krill fishery. Krill are a keystone species down in the Southern Ocean ecosystem that basically means everything down there eats krill. My supervisor always says, don't come back as a krill in the next life because everything will want to eat you. And I would add to that, if they don't, then they want to fish you. And it's mainly for these krill oil nutraceutical um, tablets, a bit like fish oil tablets. And if you take one thing away from this talk, I would urge you not to invest in these because there's not much proof that they're really any better than fish oil tablets and they seem to be doing some substantial damage. The other reason we're worried is different technologies um, in terms of the fishing activity. Um, they basically now use a big hose-like pump to vacuum krill up from the seafloor, um, which means they're very, very efficient at harvesting. Um, I just put this picture here at the top. It's Will and Bill the krill from Happy Feet. I find with conservation, it's often good to make something cute. Not very easy to make krill cute, but they are certainly very important. So I'm just going to go off on a slight aside here because I've talked about the importance of monitoring and really I want to give you an example of some really great monitoring that we're trying to base ourselves on. And also because I work down in Antarctica, I'm of course fascinated by all of the old polar explorers. So this guy here, Thomas Bagshaw, is a bit of a hero of mine. He was a geology student at Cambridge University back in the 1920s and decided he'd pack in his studies for a bit and instead go off on the very grand-sounding British expedition to Graham Land in Antarctica. This was meant to be a very big expedition of about 50 people. Um, they were going to be doing a circumnavigation of Antarctica, a flight over the pole, so really ambitious um, scientific aims. But because of funding, again, I think everybody in this room is probably familiar with that when it comes to science, it ended up being an expedition of four men. And when they got down there, the expedition leader, John Cope, and his second in command, George Wilkins, decided that actually this was not the expedition they had set out to do, and they headed back up north. Bagshaw and his companion, Maxime Lester, decided, we've come all the way to Antarctica, we're going to do some science. So what they did um, was they overwintered and stayed, in fact, for a whole year um, at this place, which is now called Waterboat Point, because they stayed in an upturned waterboat that had been left there about eight years previously. Really extreme conditions, but what it did mean is that they were able to do some amazing observations of a nearby Gen 2 penguin colony. They got observations every single day of the breeding biology, and to this day, it remains one of the best records we have. The reason I'm telling you about this is because this is what we aim to achieve, a record every day of what a colony is doing in terms of its behavior and the number of penguins that are there. But of course, challenges stand in our way. The first of these is that Antarctica is a very remote and harsh environment. I don't need to tell you that, it's famous. It's very difficult to get to logistically and financially and for safety reasons, we wouldn't be going down there all year. 
The second reason is that there are a lot of penguins. Uh, this is Tom, my supervisor on Zavodovsky Island in the South Sandwich Islands, and all of those little dots in the background are penguins, and it's basically our job to count them. Bagshaw was kind of lucky. He was at one colony. He was just looking at this particular site. But in order to monitor effectively, we want a really wide geographic distribution. So what do we do? We instead deploy time-lapse cameras, and they stay down in Antarctica for the whole year, so we don't need to be there, but there's always something there down there monitoring. They take pictures every hour throughout the whole year, and that means we not only get an idea of the number of penguins that are there in that field of view, but also on timings. So when do the penguins turn up to breed? When do the chicks hatch? When are eggs laid, et cetera, et cetera. And that can be a really important indicator of population health as well as sheer numbers. These are distributed mainly um, around the Antarctic Peninsula and the surrounding Southern Ocean region. If I show you that in a bit more detail, you can see we've got cameras up on the Falklands, across in South Georgia, further east into the South Sandwich Islands, which is where that photograph was of that enormous colony, and down on the peninsula. And I'll stress that it's not that one dot equals one camera. We actually have about 100 cameras currently in operation. This is the type of image that is produced. You will see sometimes it's very obvious. You can see the penguins nice and clearly in the foreground. Sometimes they're a little bit more difficult to see there at the back. But crucially, we have information such as the date and time the photo was taken, so we can begin to build up this idea of populations over time, and also environmental data, which is very useful, such as the temperature, directly recorded by the camera, so we can be really specific about that. You might be thinking, though, OK, you've solved problem one, which is the remoteness of the environment. Just send your camera down there. You only have to go once a year. But you've replaced the problem of having way too many penguins to count to the problem of having way too many photos of penguins to count. And that is indeed true. So the solution we've come up uh, with for this is citizen science, basically asking general members of the public to help us. So if any of you are feeling bored or like procrastinating for a good cause later, please do go on our website and check it out. It's penguinwatch.org. And if you did, you would be faced with um, an interface a little bit like this. You are provided with one of our time-lapse images randomly and simply have to click on the penguins. It's as easy as that. We don't ask you to categorize them into different species, um, but we do ask you to tag them as an adult, a chick, an egg or other, and other would be a different type of seabird, a seal, even a ship or a tourist. That's also really useful information for us. Now, it seems that clicking on penguins is highly addictive, and we've actually had over six and a half million of our images classified by this method to date, which is absolutely phenomenal, and we can't thank people enough. It's also a really lovely engagement tool and good for education, so we can go into schools with this. And if you've seen, it's perfectly simple enough um, for children to be doing and learning about the environment at the same time. Now, the whole citizen science thing can get a bit of a bad reputation sometimes. People say, well, surely how can you have one person um, from the general public analyzing your data and that be as reliable as having an expert have a look? And the fact is, it probably wouldn't be. But if we ask 10 people all to look at one image and then take the average of that, then we can begin to get some really reliable data. And I hope you'll agree that these average or consensus clicks are a really nice overlay on the image. This formed a lot of the first part of my PhD, looking at how we could cluster effectively and then comparing that to expert data to check it's reliable. So I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about that at the end if they want to know in more detail. Just to summarize then, what we have is we have the, the time-lapse images, the average citizen science data, and then we can use those time and date stamps to begin to put together a population time series. If I was to continue running that graph, then we would have something like this. If you just look at the colored lines, because those are the averages, we can really quickly see where the adults turn up and where the chicks hatch. This might look relatively simple, but it means with a few lines of code, we can take data from 50 colonies and all at the same time get this data out. And as I say, shifts in these timings, in this what we call phenology, um, is a really useful indicator of the health of a population. We can also do more traditional studies, but in a kind of quirky new way. The ecologists amongst you will have heard of mark recapture studies, where you take an individual, tag it, release it, and then see whether it's captured again later on. And you can do some statistics using probabilities to work out the likelihood that that individual is still alive. 
we kind of pride ourselves on being non-invasive. We're not handling the penguins, but we can still do this type of study by using um, our cameras and our photographs. So we've drawn polygons around nests. We can assign chicks to nests and look through the whole um, time series of images and see whether those chicks are seen later on and whether they'll survive. Um, this is something I'm working on right now and the model is running, so watch this space to see whether chick survival is being impacted by the local fishing activity. I must just mention, um, I'm nearly finished, but often the question we'll get is, why don't you just use computer vision for this? Because machine learning is an increasingly popular tool. Surely you can just get computers to count the penguins for you. The answer firstly is that you can, and there's a group in Oxford who have done a machine learning penguin counting algorithm for us. Um, I'm not talking about that too much because it's not my personal research, but I wanted to flag up the fact that it's there. But we like to have the citizen science and the machine learning. Firstly, because the citizen science creates the training data for algorithms like this, but also because it is such a good educational tool and it's a really nice way of getting the general public interested in conservation and Antarctica. So that's where I'll finish up. I'll just give you a slight heads up at the end that our preliminary results are showing that it does indeed look like the more generalist species like the Gen 2s are doing well. And when I've been down in Antarctica, you're seeing them in new places further south than they ever were before. Um, and that unfortunately, the Adelis and the Chinstraps, which are more ice dependent and which are more heavily reliant on krill, are not doing so well. But hopefully with this data, we can begin to put in some legislation um, in terms of fishing zones and things like that. Um, and hopefully things will improve. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'll just thank everybody who helps us. Field work is obviously very difficult to do without a ton of help. Um, so thank you to everybody on here, and thank you for listening. Nice, thanks. Hi everyone, um, my name is Leif, uh, I'm a botanist and uh, I'm doing my PhD down at Kew Gardens um, and this morning I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the secret sex life of anthropomorphic orchids. Um, so I'm going to start by just briefly introducing uh, my study species to you, uh, the four orchids that I'm working on. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly then about uh, hybrids between these species uh, when they reproduce with each other and the sort of populations that arise as a, res as a result of these sort of couplings. And then, yeah, talk about uh, a little bit of the work I've been doing recently, um, looking at the shape of their petals. So, my four orchids are in the genus uh, Orchis, which is the type genus uh, for the orchid family. Um, and they, these four species are sort of colloquially known as anthropomorphic orchids. And this term, anthropomorphic, uh, meaning kind of human-shaped, is very, very apt uh, because the petals of these orchids literally look like tiny little people. Almost as cute as penguins, if you think about it. Um, I think these are awesome. They are so, so cool. Um, it's literally like something out of a fairy tale. Um, and they're really sort of, yeah, wacky plants to be able to work with. So just to introduce them in slightly more detail, uh, we have the military orchid, Orchis militaris, uh, which has this sort of uh, grey helmet, if you like, of sepals and petals, and then uh, purple trench coat buttons down its front. Uh, we then have the man orchid, Orchis anthropophora, uh, sort of your traffic light crossing man, if you like, uh, which comes in this yellow form and a dark brown form. And there's the monkey orchid, Orchis simia, with these finer purple appendages. Uh, and this one is really 3D, they sort of curl around. Uh, and a lot of them have this little tail as well, giving it the name monkey orchid. And then finally, my favorite of the four, uh, the lady orchid, Orchis purpurea. And I think the, uh, the botanists of the 16th century thought uh, this one had a sort of a bonnet of red uh, sepals and petals, and then this sort of flowing white dress uh, for the lip, the main petal of the flower. So these four orchids, um, they all grow in Western Europe um, and actually here in England as well. And I hope you'll agree that they all look very different. Um, in fact, they're so different that anyone could sit down with a very simple botanical key and be able to tell which one was which. 
uh, despite the fact, even if they'd never, you know, studied plants before. But uh, these orchids aren't quite as innocent as they first seem, because um, when they grow in the same place, they literally can't keep their hands off one another, um, and they will quite happily engage in a bit of light-hearted, uh, interspecific pollination, if you like. It's probably the sauciest thing I'll say all day. Um, and they reproduce with each other quite happily um, and sort of abundantly in these populations. So to give you an example, um, if you have a monkey orchid uh, growing with man orchids, uh, they will immediately start reproducing with each other and form these sort of 50-50 intermediates, which kind of look like you've just merged a man orchid with a monkey orchid. So in this case, it kind of uh, the inflorescence, the whole flower spike looks kind of like the shape of a man orchid, but it's got the coloration of the monkey orchid, and the, uh, the individual sort of human-shaped petals kind of look half and half. So they do really, really look like these 50-50 intermediates. And when the, uh, some our preliminary data have shown that when the man orchid is one of the two parents, uh, the hybrids are sterile. They are sort of genetic dead ends. Uh, they will sort of live for a few years, but they won't be able to pass on any of their genes. However, our data also shows that when the monkey orchid, lady orchid, and military orchid uh, are involved as two of the parents, uh, then the hybrids are um, fertile. And what that means is that these uh, hybrids are then able to reproduce with each other and sort of form hybrids of hybrids. Uh, they were able to reproduce with uh, both of their parents as well. And so what you end up with is these enormous populations where you've got a load of, uh, say, monkey orchids, you've got a load of lady orchids, and then you've got this sort of spectrum of hybrids and all this mix of uh, intermediates in between. So an example of that one uh, between the lady orchid and the military orchid. Uh, so these photos at the top are, again, hopefully you'll notice different plants. Uh, and I've cut uh, their petals and stuck them underneath for you. Again, very, very different things. So I'm just going to move those to either side and introduce some hybrids. Uh, so you still get these sort of 50-50 intermediates, which look half like one, half like the other, um, both in the shape of the petals and in the coloration of the plants as well. But if this intermediate hybrid, uh, the first generation of hybrid, if you like, then decides it wants to reproduce the lady orchid, then the offspring is going to look uh, something that's more like a lady orchid because it's got more lady orchid DNA uh, in its genome. But if the hybrid, the, fifth, the middle hybrid here, decides actually it wants to mate with a military orchid, uh, then the, hybrid, the resulting offspring will look more like a military orchid because it now has more military orchid in its DNA. And so what you end up with is this spectrum um, again, both in coloration uh, and in uh, the shape of these petals. And so what I wanted to do was sort of attack this in a three-pronged approach. Um, so I wanted to look firstly at the DNA, uh, and I wanted to see if there's sort of a genetic spectrum that spans between lady orchids and military orchids. Uh, I also wanted to look at the color. Because uh, as you can see, it kind of ranges from dark, dark red um, hood, if you like, and then a pale lip, right the way through pink to the other end of the military orchids where they've got a much paler hood and a darker lip. And then the third, uh, third thing I wanted to look at was the shape of these petals, uh, because, you know, they're people-shaped and they look really cool, so uh, why wouldn't you be interested in these? Um, and so that's what I'm going to briefly talk to you about now, trying to work out why or how you can morph the lady orchid lip right the way through to the military orchid at the end there through these hybrids. So what I did uh, was I collected petals from these plants and I drew, painstakingly drew outlines around all of these uh, petals and then uh, got, the, got the computer to put 300 points all the way around uh, these um, petals. And I did this for uh, almost 300 petals from a population and made this graph. So this is, uh, it's called a principal components analysis. And for those of you who aren't aware of what it is, 
basically we have, uh, so each triangle on this graph represents an individual orchid, um, I, from which I sampled three petals. So the three points on the triangle represent those three petals. The dot in the middle is the mean shape of the petals. In a principal components analysis, uh, in this case, more similar shapes will cluster closer together. And so what's really encouraging is that, uh, just to start off with, the yellow triangles, which are lady orchids, are all clustered together, and the green triangles, um, which are the military orchids, are all clustered together as well. And there's no obvious overlap. So immediately, they're sort of um, quite obviously different things. Now, if you go up and down the y-axis, uh, this is how the shape changes. And then along from left to right on the uh, x-axis, again, that's how the shape changes. And again, encouragingly, the one on the left uh, at the bottom here um, looks like a lady orchid. Uh, that's just a grayed out uh, lady orchid petal. And the one on the right looks like a military orchid. So already, we're doing really well. I then introduced the hybrids, uh, which were in pink. And really satisfyingly, they lie right down the middle um, just where you'd expect them to be. But there is a little bit of overlap. Um, and so what I did, mainly because I'd been plotting 300 points around these petals, which took such a long time, um, I decided to make a subset of those 300. Uh, and so I picked out 15 very specific points. Um, and so I took uh, two on the shoulders, on the hands, armpit, waist, two on each leg, two in the groin, and two, uh, one at the end of what I'm going to call the tail for the purposes of this talk. Um, but there, anyway, there are 15 points which I thought most accurately captured uh, the information that was being genetically encoded. And what I did was I ran exactly the same analysis, um, so everything is exactly the same, and we still get this clustering where you've got yellow lady orchids all together, green military orchids all together, and no obvious overlap. The shape changes up and down or along each axis um, is basically the same. And again, the lady orchid looks, still looks like a lady orchid, and the military orchid still looks like a military orchid. Obviously, they're more simplified because you've only got 15 points rather than 300. Uh, but the shape change is still there. And so that's great, because it means that I don't have to spend all my time plotting all the way around these petals. I can just click on these very specific landmarks um, and still get the same information. Introducing the hybrids, and again, they fall right down the middle, uh, which is all uh, really nice and really, really useful for my research. However, this graph actually doesn't, at the moment, doesn't really tell us very much um, because the only information encoded in this graph is uh, shape, the shape of the lip. But in reality, what I did when I was going around was I was looking at a plant and thinking, okay, this is a military orchid because, yes, it's, the petal looks like a military orchid petal, but also it's got these specific colors. And there's nothing to do with colors or anything in here. And so what I want to do um, next is to analyze the color of these flowers. Uh, this picture up at the top here is actually mid-DNA analysis, DNA extraction. Um, but it's, you can see how on the left you've got military orchid, in the middle a hybrid, and on the right the lady orchid, and there's this gradient of color. And so I want to incorporate a sort of pigment analysis into my shape analysis and use that as a sort of uh, morph morphology proxy to say what the plant looks like. And I want to do various uh, genetic analyses which will then allow me to say, OK, this plant here is genetically a military orchid. Uh, what does the shape of its uh, lip look like, and what color is it? And I want to combine those sort of two elements uh, to try and tell this overall story. So to sum up, um, my PhD is basically looking at these four orchids. Uh, they all have petals that look like little people, and they all look very different. But when they grow in the same place, uh, they reproduce with one another, and they form these intermediate hybrids, which you could argue are their own separate species. And so what I'm trying to work out is why, uh, why do these four separate species remain as four species, uh, rather than just merging into one big hybrid superspecies? 
Um, that's it from me. Thank you very much to these wonderful people, uh, to you guys for listening. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'd be very happy to take them. Hi everyone, as you've just heard, my name's Ollie. I'm a PhD student at the University of Reading, and in this talk, I'm going to introduce you to the subject of my research, which is on this amazing tree and the incredible landscapes it inhabits. Uh, Araucaria's tale is a story of plants, people, and climate change in the past, present, and future. In this talk, I'm going to try and tell you or show you why you ought to care about this tree, and then to show what happens when people haven't cared for it in the past. We're going to then work, try and work out what's going to happen to it in the future, then take a broad view and try and see what lessons we can learn from the past to try and make sure that we can safeguard it for the generations to come. So without further ado, let's get on location. Let's go to Brazil. Um, to find this tree, you need to go down to the south. You might want to fly into the coastal city of Florianopolis, uh, get in the car, drive inland in almost any direction, and within an hour or two, you will hit this. It is a wall of rock in places more than a kilometer high, and you have reached the entrance to the South Brazilian highlands. Our story takes place on this plateau. Up here, the climate is quite distinctive. It's very constant all year round. It's wet the whole time. The summers are quite warm, uh, but they're still quite temperate. And in the winters, waterfalls can freeze. It takes some pretty special uh, ecosystems to survive up here. And there are two which I think we need to pay attention to. Both of them are part of one of the world's great biodiversity hotspots, Brazil's Atlantic Forest. The first is Araucaria Forest. Uh, it's green on these maps, and it grows from about 500 meters elevation. It's a slightly weird, quite variable mix of cold adapted and tropical plants. And then as you get higher up in elevation, it starts to form mosaics with, and then eventually give way to, these species-rich natural grasslands called campos. And those will start to become more common as the elevation gets up towards its maximum around about 1,800 meters. Now, whether you're in campos, or an Araucaria forest, you cannot escape the star of the show, the Araucaria tree. Now, this tree has been important to people for many thousands of years, almost as long as people have been in this region. Um, I've got here some cues just to remind myself. So people in the southern state of Santa Catarina said that it was, among all the trees they knew, it was the most valuable and useful to them. Particularly, they said that because of its use as food. So it produces nuts that are a bit like uh, pine nuts on steroids. You can roast them, you can ferment them, you can make them into flour. They're a really popular snack. In 2017, more than 9,000 tonnes were produced, worth about five and a half million dollars. Now, it's not just a snack or a festival celebrating the snack that's been going for 30 years. Those seeds were a key part of food security before European arrival of the indigenous people of the highlands, the Southern Jay, who I'll come on to a little bit more later on. And then it's just a cultural icon. It's found on the coat of arms of the state of Paraná, whose state capital takes its name from the tree. It is a big deal in southern Brazil, and it has been for thousands of years. But the species is far older than that. If you're looking at it and thinking it looks a bit familiar, you may very well be right. It's the closest relative of the monkey puzzle tree, which you can find in Chile, Argentina, and the occasional suburban garden. Um, these are extremely ancient trees, very ancient species. They have been on separate evolutionary paths to each other for about, round about 28 million years. That's a number that I find too big to get my head around, so if you squash that into 24 hours, North and South America only met around about half past nine in the evening. The earliest evidence of home, the earliest, the earliest evidence for Homo sapiens comes from about quarter to midnight. These trees are very ancient, and the genus stretches back to the Jurassic. But the next bit of this story unfolds over a much, much quicker timescale. In that 24 hours concept, we start a literal blink of an eye, a third of a second before midnight. And we need a different way to conceive and to conceptualize this time. Uh, now, we've had cute penguins, we've had cute orchids, and so I'm going to play my trump card, him. This is my son. He is five weeks old today. Uh, he's called Samuel, and isn't he cute? Isn't he a great baby? Um, th this is him with my dad when he was a couple of days old, his grandpa. And this is me a few years ago with dad's dad, my grandpa, on his 90th birthday, which is my wedding day. Now, I'm not just showing you these to show off, although, like I say, he's a great baby. Um, I'm showing you this because the next two sections of Arakari's story, the story of this ancient species, take place within our lifetimes, the four of us. So, 
in this first part, I want to explore how we got to the present day situation. You don't have to go back very far, maybe 150 years, to find a time when Araucaria covered the hills on the southern Brazilian highlands. It was, as it says up here, almost suffocating in its majesty. But then around about 1870, there started to be some commercial exploitation of its timber. It was quite small scale, it wasn't a big deal, it was fairly local. But that started to change around 1910, with increased immigration from Germany and Italy, and then as technological innovations happened. And you can see fairly quickly, it surpassed the present day levels. Exports surpassed the present day production levels, that dotted line. So by the time my grandpa was born, it was um, picking up quite a lot. And shortly after, when he was a child, people started making warnings about the unsustainability of this. But those warnings went unheeded. By the time we reached 1940, when my grandpa was a teenager, there's another boom. By the time my dad was born, it's around the peak time. And then by the time my dad himself was a teenager, in about 1970, we find that Araucaria stocks have been so depleted, it's no longer commercially viable. This species was almost wiped out between 1870 and 1970. The year before I was born, a 1989 assessment of satellite imagery suggested that 97% of Araucaria's former area had been destroyed. Where previously it would have covered the dark gray areas on this map and bits of the light gray, now all of the region's remaining forests are these green speckles. Where you see green on dark gray, that is all that is left of the Araucaria forest. It is critically endangered, on the brink of extinction. And the first part of my research is to find out what's going to happen next. Now, as I said at the beginning, the plateau has got a very particular kind of climate, very constant. Uh, on this map, it's the kind of, uh, on the map on the left, it's the, kind of the one called CFB, the kind of bluish green one. And you can see that Araucaria's distribution, the kind of light green on the bigger map, maps pretty well to this climate type. But predictions have shown that by the end of this century, that climate type will have vanished from Brazil. And so the question is, what will that mean for Araucaria? And that's the first thing I'm trying to find out. I'm doing this by building species distribution models. You take records of where a species is, records of what the climate is like in those areas, and you use statistics to relate the two. That way, when you bring in new climate data, the models can predict how likely you are to find your species in a certain place. And I want to do this in as much detail as possible so that we can find areas where the forest is most likely to survive. Now, when you look from aerial images or satellite images like this, you can notice that particularly at high elevations, the forest seems to follow river valleys or it's on sheltered slopes away from direct sunlight or wind exposure. And it's possible that if climate change is going to be bad news for Araucaria, there may remain little areas, these micro refugia, where it can survive. And so I've been trying to locate these with my models. Now, I've done two different sets of models. I've done climate-only models, which are the smaller ones higher up, and I've done a second set that incorporate these landscape features on very fine scale. Again, to put it into perspective, the climate-only models, the pixels for that, you could walk across in about 10 minutes. The pixels for the landscape-level models, you could cross a pixel every 20 seconds. These are extremely high resolution. And you can see that the predictions for the present are reasonably accurate. The sort of darker green areas that have been modelled map pretty well to the campos and forest areas that we know exist, or that should exist. And then when we look to what happens in the future, the picture gets a bit more muddy. It is certainly not good news. What we tend to see is that Araucaria's current strongholds, there its grip gets weaker. And there's not anywhere blindingly obvious where it's going to go instead. But crucially, when we incorporate this fine-scale topography into our maps, we start to see these dark green areas remain, sort of three shapes down sort of in the lower section of the highlands and in the center. This is where our best bet would be for conserving Araucaria against climate change. Now, this map is a little bit of a affront to the eyes at times, but when you've got darker grays, the black colors and the red colors show these potential micro refugia, these places where the forest could survive. If the colors are slightly lighter, the climate is going to, or Araucaria will be less resilient in these areas. What we find is when you zoom in, you can see that some of these landscape features, particularly river valleys, will be key in the highlands to keeping Araucaria safe from climate change. But what you also see is an awful lot of grayscale areas. Where you can see black on this map, those are areas which would be the most resilient for Araucaria, but which have lost their natural vegetation. They've been deforested or overgrazed or turned into plantations. More than a third of this most crucial habitat type for Araucaria has been lost in the last century. 
And what's more, when we look at where those resilient remnants are, they're almost all of them in the Campos grasslands, where Araucaria trees only grow in little islands and ribbons of forest. And they're missed by almost all of these colored outlines, the protected areas. This means that it's going to be quite difficult for us to manage Araucaria into the future in a way that's going to safeguard it. So when we ask, what will 21st century climate change bring for Araucaria? The overall story is probably one of bad news. It's not unmitigated bad news. There are some things that might be helpful. And there will be micro refugia that shelter this forest and shelter this tree into the future. But the question remains, when we're looking to 2070 with these projections, when my son will be middle-aged, when I might be a grandfather, this species is older than our species by a considerable length of time. We should not just be looking for it to survive to next century, another blink of an eye. We need to be thinking much longer term than that. It should have hundreds of thousands more years. And when it comes to predicting that, we can't trust the models. The future is just too uncertain. And so the best place to turn to is the past. We have hundreds of thousands of years of evidence as to what has changed. And so from that, we might be able to make predictions as to what could happen in the future. And so this is the second prong of my research. And if we're going to talk about plants, and we're going to talk about the past, then we need to talk about pollen. Leif mentioned it earlier. Pollen is amazing stuff. And it's particularly useful for finding out about the past. It is some of the toughest stuff in nature. Uh, this chemical sporopollenin, which makes up its walls, has been called the diamond of the plant world. It's amazing. You can find pollen in rocks that is 240 million years old. And you don't even have to go that far to ancient rocks. If you can find yourself some waterlogged sediment from a bog or from a lake, then you will find that pollen has probably been caught in there and stacked up over time. And this is useful because this means you can then track changes in vegetation over this course of time. So I brought along some props for this. You might be able to find, 3D printed, daisy pollen. If you find at the same level dandelion, you might find quite a bit of grass. And then you can start to build up a picture that at that depth, at that age, you have got a grassland. Then if you get a little bit further up, you might start to find, let's see, oak pollen, hazel, potentially even pine, the Mickey Mouse pollen grain. You then start to get a picture that you've got a transition somewhere along that line from grassland to forest. If you can then throw in some radiocarbon dates, you can figure out how the vegetation has changed through this time period. And while these examples are all European, it's exactly the same case in southern Brazil. You can see how transitions have happened from the Campos grassland pollen all the way through to Araucaria forests. But much as pollen is amazing, and I'm a huge advocate of it, it does have some problems. When you look at where pollen sites have been put in southern Brazil, they are small, sparse, and spatially biased. All of these sites will only give you a local signal. They'll tell you about what happens nearby to that bog. They don't cover huge swathes of this forest. In fact, they're particularly concentrated along the eastern edge of the plateau. And that means that in all of this area, we know very, very little about what happened. In addition, some research we've been doing has shown that lots of the pollen taxa are very hard to see in the pollen record. Some, including Araucaria, uh, this top long line here, are more common in the pollen record than in the forest. If you find a pollen record with about 23% po uh, Araucaria pollen, it's probably about 10% Araucaria in the forest. But by contrast, there are more species which are silent in the pollen record. You can't see their pollen at all. And I'm afraid, Leif, I suspect all kids would be some of them. As well as that, you have an awful lot more that if they're not silent, then they are hardly whispering at all. It is hard to get a full picture of how the forest is behaving through pollen alone. You just don't get the detail. So I want to try and fix that by applying the future-facing methods backwards. So I've been building, and I'm going to carry on building, some models that look at different key taxa of Araucaria forest and Campos and to see how they behaved through long periods of time. You can see here that the bottom Campos taxa show a fairly good idea of where the grasslands are at present and the forest ones more extensive. And if we go back 21,000 years, you can start to see that they have moved. The forest has shifted generally west, but not all in the same way. And the Campos taxa have expanded and moved south. These things are incredibly useful for figuring out what has happened. They give us an idea, a baseline estimate of what we should see in the pollen record if climate were the boss. Now, pollen records have said that the forest expanded quite slowly and gradually about 4,000 years ago, and then in a much bigger way, much faster, around 1,000 years ago. 
The question has been debated. Is that climate? Or might there be another cause? Might it have been people? I mentioned earlier that the Araucaria forests were hugely important to the indigenous southern Jay people. Uh, they, had, they were ritually central, they were key to their diets. And you can see that their, the Jay culture occupied large extenses of the Araucaria forest. They depended on it. And you see that when their culture boomed, this sort of pink-purple line, it happened at roughly the same time as the forests expanded. You get expansions of Araucaria pollen, the second line in, and you get a transition from the right-hand side from grassland to forest at around about the same time when the rainfall, the leftmost graph, is not doing very much clear at all. So the question is, are these changes the ones that we would see with climate, or have the people been changing things up a little bit? Now, this is something that I am going to try and investigate, and I'm going to be doing that with a pollen site that is inside the, arch the archaeological site of a village. Uh, all these little circles are pit houses that look like this. It's been well studied, and if, when we look at this, we find things that look different to what we would expect from the models, or what we find in other pollen sites, far from evidence of human activity, then potentially we're starting to see evidence that the people may have changed the forest against the grain of climate change. And that is hugely important. Not only because indigenous people in Brazil are among the most marginalized in the country, potentially even in the world, but also because if climate change is pushing against Araucari's continued survival and the indigenous people found a way of promoting it, we would do well to learn from them and see if we can bring these ideas from the past into the future. So to conclude, I want you to think, if you think about my presentation again, not only about pollen models, but also about models and pollen. By using models, we can make predictions about what the forest is going to do in the future, and then we can also bring them back and look at the long-term past to get a fuller picture of how the forests have developed through this long-term time. And then by bringing pollen in, not only can we test our models, we can also start to see where people may have brought different things through from the climate. That could help us to make a big difference in understanding how Araucari is going to behave in the future and to help us survive not only until my son is an old man, but way into the future, long after our society is gone. That's what I'm hoping to do with my PhD research. Hopefully I'll be able to come back in a couple of years and tell you how I've got on. Thank you. Hi, I'm a PhD student at the University of Kent. My PhD is about the contemporary use of medicinal plants in Jamaica and Jamaican medicinal plants in London. But today I'm talking about some work I've been doing at the Bristol Museum as part of the British Society for the History of Science Postgraduate Engagement Fellowship, looking at a text produced in Jamaica in the 18th century by Reverend John Lindsay, who is a Scottish priest who documented the Natural History of Jamaica. He wrote about five manuscripts, one on plants, one on insects, uh, one on mammals, one on fish, another one's been lost. But he couldn't get funding to publish it, so he never finished it. And so there's only the originals that still survive in Bristol. I'm focusing on the Elegancies of Jamaica edition, which documents the use and cultivation of about 100 species and has illustrations of all of them although 50 species don't have descriptions. And so for the history of science, I want to try and think about how this work fits into understanding the history of botany and how science is done. So to begin with, I looked at sort of a conventional history of botany, one particular way it's been told, and um, use examples from an address given by botanist William Stern to the Linnaean Society in 1957. And it's a particular story that puts Europe and European scientists at the centre. So uh, one part of this story is the idea of objectivity and the pure pursuit of knowledge. So for Stern, it was the rational system that was a motivation for documenting the world's plants. And he, this gives this the primacy for the reasons why people wanted to travel around the world and learn about plants. And he references someone else who talks about this objectivity separating 
man from the focus of thought so that plant might be placed there. But as Stern himself, himself acknowledges, uh, a lot of early botany was linked to empire, and here's an illustration of the Spice Islands, so several hundred years before Linnaeus's publications, people were already exploring the world looking for new commodities, and the Dutch were trying to circumvent the Arabian spice trade to make money. And that was a big reason for understanding plants and for exploring new areas. He also argues that botany originated in Europe, and uses this map of where botany and science came from. And he uses sort of a climate explanation, a biological explanation for why botany originated in Europe, because of there were less plants, so it was easier to come up with a simple system. Uh, and of course, this story puts Europeans at the center, as the portraits in this room do. And he celebrates the intrepid spirit with little prospect of material ward, reward and little fame. But one of the people he references is Hans Sloan, who traveled to Jamaica in the early 18th century. He was a physician, and he collected plants there and became quite famous in London as a private physician based in no small part on his publications from his experiences in Jamaica, his collections, and also the money he made from marrying into a slave-owning family. This conventional history of botany also relies on an idea of European exceptionalism. So this is the cover for one of Linnaeus's publications, and holding the torch is the Greek god Apollo, but he's been given Linnaeus's face and he's holding the torch of enlightenment, and he's pushing back the shroud of darkness. And then we have non-Europeans presenting plants to the Europeans. But these aren't mentioned in Stern's address. He only talks about the stimulating impact of tropical nature, not of the people that lived in the tropics and knew about plants. And the idea that there's something particular about the Western mind which allowed for this rationality. So more recently, of course, botanical institutions have been trying to address this. So I found a blog from Kew Gardens talking about the hidden histories which lie behind the names of European donors. Uh, the Natural History Museum video, a lot of contributions have gone and recorded legacies of health, the development of science. And in March at the Linnaean Society, there was a conference that wants to recognize the known and hidden contributions of ethnic minorities to natural history. But this still raises many more questions, and I think we can go further to look at why people have been excluded and who is included. So this example is, um, from the Natural History Museum blog is of a freed slave in Suriname called Graman Kwasi, and his he just was the first person to describe Cassia Amara, so it's Linnaeus named it after him. But he's the exception to the rule of the majority of people who remembered in plant names are white European men. And part of the reason he was able to have this position was because he helped the Dutch capture escaped slaves. So there are many more people that were involved in the practice of botany, and they were people that would be porters for Europeans, or people that would be interviewed for knowledge, or that would have preserved plants and cultivated them. So I'm drawing on a literature more recently that looks, tries to go beyond this conventional history of botany and look just beyond Europe and look at how botany arose out of these imperial networks that brought many new plants to Europe. And it was these new plants that disrupted the old systems of taxonomy and called for the development of new ones. There's a strong economic motivation for this. And um, what Schabinger calls bioprospecting. So this bit, the, it's painted not so much as a contribution to natural history, but more as a, the theft of knowledge, because people aren't acknowledged. And Chakrabarti talks about the theories that made this possible. 
Um, so if we take this approach, then we're thinking not just about how non-Europeans contributed to science, but also how science contributed to colonialism, to racism, and the institutions of empire. So I'll try and illustrate this with examples from the text I was working on. So this is Okra, and Lindsay in The Elegancies book discusses its use as food. And this is one of the many plants that would have been brought to Jamaica via the African the slave trade in Africans. And it was cultivated in the provision grounds of the enslaved Africans. Many slave owners wouldn't provide the enslaved with food or with not much food, so they had as well as working the fields for the sugar plantations, cocoa plantations, coffee and cotton plantations. They had small provision grounds where they'd grow many different plants that they knew from Africa and that in this way the knowledge survived. And in Southern America, okra is known as gumbo and that originates from the Congolese name Quilobo. And although lots of these histories aren't written down, we can find out about them in the names of plants and that's one way this knowledge survives. So the many other species that survived the Middle Passage uh, that I mentioned in Lindsay's text. He talks about the garden egg, the aubergine, the bitter gourd, Memoria catrantia, and sorghum. And there's lots of research looking at African botany in the Americas and how it survived, and many different crops only survived in the Americas because of African knowledge. The Europeans didn't know much about farming in the tropics. So as well as plants introduced from West Africa, there were also plants that were already growing in the Caribbean, such as tobacco. And Africans would have learnt some of the uses of these from the Amerindian population. There were also maroon communities in Jamaica, communities of escaped slaves that would have had contact with the indigenous population. Although in Jamaica, most of them were killed by the Spanish or deported as slaves before the British arrived. Other species that grew in Jamaica is the prickly pear that's still eaten today and known as tuna. And Lindsay talks a lot about how the ways it can be used. Pineapple was introduced from uh, South America by Amerindians and the pawpaw was introduced by the Spanish. So there's quite a mix of different influences on the, the botany and the knowledge of plants in Jamaica. Here, Lindsay talks of our slaves are glad of any fruits, and this might prove a very choice, and ready to support to them at all times. So that's one of the reasons for including it in his book, is he's concerned with how to feed the people he keeps as slaves, because he married, he too, like Hans Sloan, um, had his estates in Jamaica. And you can also see how he was in con conversation with other botanists at the time and their, the different names they give to the plants. But he's not really accepting of one system and he wasn't particularly uh, interested in the new systems of classification from Linnaeus. He just lists different names that other botanists were given but for many other species, he doesn't even bother to give them scientific names. Uh, another motiv motivation for recording stuff in his books was the medicinal use of plants. And this one, the antidote cocoon, was very good, important, because in Jamaica, which was 90% Afri enslaved Africans and only maybe 10% white Europeans. They were very scared of rebellions and poisonings by slaves. So this was, he recorded the use and preparation of this plant. Uh, he was also very interested by economic crops that he probably had grown on his plantations. And so cotton was an important one of them and he thinks it's he goes, the one he talks about most in the text, about the, the way it can be harvested, 
cultivated and the money that can be made. And see in this quote that he talks about the planter's labor, referring to the slave owners, but it's the Africans that were doing the work. And here's some details of how corn, how it could be cultivated. And if anyone's familiar with the Three Sisters planting system of Native Americans, it sounds quite similar to that, though he doesn't mention where he gets the, the idea from. So if we're looking at bioprospecting as a motivation for botanical research, you can see examples of how uh, Europeans profited from the knowledge of enslaved Africans and indigenous Amerindians with the crops that were big commodities for the empire, cocoa, cotton, rice, millet, sesame, black-eyed pea, and oil palm, which all relied on the knowledge of Amerindians and Africans. There's also an interest to discover new medicines for new diseases, and chinchona was very important for the imperial project. Um, before that, most Europeans that went into the interior of West Africa died of malaria. New medicines for old treatments, so Ipecuana from South America was a very popular emetic that was introduced from South America. Tea, which was smuggled out from China, and rubber. So describing these plants and recording their uses supported settlement, expansion, and new commodities for empire. It also provided botanists with scientific collections that gave them social prestige. So we see a similar process in Elegancies of Jamaica. The botanical descriptions are referring to other botanists, but it doesn't take a very systematic approach. Um, the selection of species or the use of names or the information recorded. Some only have 100 word descriptions, but Cotton has 2,000. Uh, he's clearly interested in how these plants can benefit the planter class of Jamaica as commercial crops, the antidotes to poison, and food for the enslaved. Interest in medicinal uses, food crops, and he doesn't acknowledge the contribution of African knowledge in the text. And rely more on the sort of impersonal language of scientific observation. It is used, it makes, um, although occasionally it does observe what the enslaved Africans get up to. So Jamaica was the wealthiest colony in the British Empire for many years, and this was based mainly on the sugar plantations. And but we see there are many other crops that were grown and introduced to Jamaica because of the African knowledge that survived the slave trade. Um, this was documented as a potential resource for the Scientific Imperial Project, and this contribution wasn't acknowledged by Lindsay. Uh, there's also cases, not just of people being interviewed, but people also being tortured to reveal how the poisons were made and how they were, could be treated. Traditional African practices of religion were outlawed, such as Obia in Jamaica, because that was seen to be linked to poison, and many uses weren't recorded because they weren't of interest to botanists at the time, so ritual use or the use of abortifacients, women's medicine, so-called, uh, don't appear in the historical record. Uh, he also wrote in defense of slavery, so he didn't bother finishing his manuscript on plants and wrote 80,000 words about why slavery was justified by religion, but also used the language of science, talking of genus or race, class or race of people, and also the idea of a hierarchy. Um, so you can see in these quotes, it's a mix of God's design and natural order of things. Again, you think back to holding the torch of enlightenment, People that are too close to nature are blind to all scientific knowledge. And this fitted in with other science scientists at the time that later fed into the development of scientific racism. And part of the reasons for this were discovering new plants and bioprospecting relied on a hierarchy of knowledge, which implied a hierarchy of people. 
is colonial governance and bureaucracy also regulating who and who wasn't a citizen or, or had access to political citizenship. The biology classification, classifying the natural world, <coughs> plants we can see influenced and fed into classifying people. And the idea, this was also implied by the idea of a natural order, so there's no overlap between emerging objective taxonomy, but older ideas of a natural order based on God's design. And for example, Linnaeus divided humans into four varieties, including one of which was the European who was ruled by law and the African who was governed by caprice. And this, the social authority of science uh, fed into the scientific racism. So just to conclude, if we look at the history of Jamaica we have to th and botany and plants, we have to think about which uses are included or not included, whose voice is included and not included, and the motivations for this, and the ideas that make this possible as well. So the ideas of rationality, scientific methods, botanical classification, hierarchy, and the natural order. And if we look at this, then there's no trans-historical objectivity, the motivation for investigating and asking questions of science are different at different times for different reasons. And this is often based on power relations that support research and shape questions. And we need to think not just of the contribution of non-Europeans to botany, but also the contribution of botany to maintaining unequal power relations. So that's the end of the talk. Everyone hear me? Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Camilla, I'm a third year PhD student at Royal Holloway University. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about, the, I'm going to start off talking about the broad kind of context of my work and what are the problems. Um, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about how my PhD research fits into this by telling you a bit about what I did, where I did it and some of my results. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit at the end about why this is important, why should we care. So, as everyone here knows, over the past century, century and a half, human population has been increasing at an unprecedented rate. And this has, with this increase has come an over-exploitation of our natural world. So, just to give you some stats, I mean, you're all probably really familiar with a graph, this graph or graph similar to this. From the 1820s till roughly current day, I mean, that's 2016, you can see an increase in human population size from about 1 billion to over 7 billion. So, this is a massive increase. And not only there's more of us, but we are also more connected. So now more than ever before, I'm connected to someone in this room, and I can be easily connected with someone living on the other side of the globe. And this is due to an improvement in, uh, in technology and infrastructure. I mean, roads, planes, the internet, to give you a few examples. And so what does this mean? Um, well, this means that we're, what does this mean for our environment? It means we're exploiting it a lot more. And what I'm going to be talking about today, and what I'm mainly interested in is the bushmeat trade, bushmeat hunting. Uh, bushmeat is the meat that comes from wild animals. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this has changed and what this means for the animals that are being hunted. So as before, you might have found a hunter living in some tropical forests in West Africa, hunting to feed his family. Now, because of this inc huge increase in population, human population size and connectivity, um, what we find is that it's a lot easier to take um, animals from the, the forest, the natural environment, into the cities. And the cities are kind of the hubs of where most humans concentrate. Um, and so what has happened is there's been kind of a shift from what is called subsistence hunting, so the hunter feeding his family and just taking a really small proportion of meat from the forest, to huge commercial hunting. Hunters now hunt for a profit. They, they have easy access to the cities. They know they can sell these carcasses for a lot of money. And that's what they're doing more and more. And this is aided by this increase in connectivity. And so this is a huge uh, problem because obviously that means that a lot more animals are being taken by the for it, from the forest than ever before. Um, and I'm, what I'm going to be focusing on today is bushmeat hunting, focusing on monkeys, uh, which are being hunted for their meat. People eat monkeys in a lot of parts of the world. Um, and so what if you think of this is kind of 
uh, the area where I was doing my work. Tropical forest. I know it's only monkeys, there's lots of other species there as well, but this is just to introduce and to kind of give you a bit of an idea, I'm not biased at all, of kind of what might be happening, what this huge uh, bushmeat hunting, commercial bushmeat hunting is driving. A forest, and this is and introducing the concept of empty forests. So forests are like a great, um, well, it's also very rare to find beautiful intact primary forests these days as well, but there are some fragments that are still intact and they might seem rich in biodiversity, but when you actually go in there, the number of monkeys or any kind of other species that you might see will look something more like this rather than what I was showing you previously. And so this is a huge um, of problem, obviously, for other species that are endangered. Um, also because uh, species that are rare are kind of become more of a delicacy. You kind of find what is rare is kind of precious, right? So what you might find is that same hunter knows that if one, one of these species is worth a lot of money, he can sell it for a lot more because there's less, less of them and you're less likely to see them. So it's kind of like a vicious circle in a, set, in a way. They get, become more endangered and the more they're endangered, some of them become you know, more requested or more in higher demand. And there's a lot of evidence to support that a lot of species numbers are declining incredibly. A paper from two years ago estimated that around 83% of mammals and 58% of bird species are showing declining populations in hunted areas compared to unhunted ones in the tropics. But today I'm going to be talking to you about my work, which is not focusing on species numbers, but it's focusing on behaviors, and specifically monkey behaviors. And so, um, introducing anti-predator behaviors. These are behaviors that animals that are preyed upon do to basically avoid being eaten and killed. So simply running away from your predator, you might change your group size, the idea of safety in numbers. The more, of, the more individuals that look like me are surrounding me, the less likely I am to be singled out and eaten. Um, freezing, so just merely like hiding and hoping for the best. Or behaviors such as vocalization, signaling, signaling to a member of your group, look, there's a predator, we better go. Um, and so there's evidence to suggest that, obviously, if the human, uh, as a hunter, is considered a predator, these behaviors would uh, have evolved to run away um, from human predators. And not only that, but there's evidence to suggest that these have been adapted. So for example, uh, one species called Diana monkey, which is one of my focus species, um, has been found to vocal, is very vo vocal, and it vocals a lot to members of its group um, to signal the presence of predators. But when the predators are human, it's actually been found that they, they, they've learnt to vocalize less because actually humans are incredibly efficient hunters with their guns. And if, if these animals are vocalizing, actually, it just makes it easier for them to be hunted. So generally, more avoidance behaviors, more behaviors that kind of try and make these animals less and less visible to human presence. And where was I doing this? Well, I was working in Africa, in Sierra Leone and Liberia, uh, in West Africa. Um, in what is called the Gola Forest. And I was, so all of those yellow lines that you see were the lines that I was walking in the forest looking for monkey groups. Um, and I kind of want to broadly classify it in three different regions. So you have the purple area is the national park in Sierra Leone, and it's been protected for about 10 years now. Um, the greeny blue one is a national park in Liberia that's only just been established. It was actually being demarcated whilst I was doing my research. And this dashed area is a community forest, which is the idea, it's an ongoing project that in the future it's going to be managed by the local communities. They're going to have areas for conservation and areas for offtake. But at the moment, what you find is that actually there seems to be a lot of hunting going on there. So to connect that to what I was saying previously, what you might expect to see in these three different areas is different levels of hunting pressure. The park in Sierra Leone, you might expect low levels of hunting pressure. It's been protected for a long time. There's a lot of uh, patrols on the ground, um, and so it's illegal to hunt in this area. Um, it's illegal to hunt endangered species anywhere, but certain species are allowed to be hunted, but within a national park, they're not. So you would expect there to be lower levels of hunting pressure there compared to medium in the Gola Forest, because it's only just been established. Yes, there's patrols, but as everything, it takes a long time before law enforcement can, can actually be proper established, especially in countries, uh, some Western African countries like these that fairly recently have had civil wars, and so it's all kind of coming together, but it takes a while. And the community forests, finally, you would expect there to be more hunting pressure going on there. And this is just to give you an idea of what it looks like from above. Um, that's me with my 
research assistant Emmanuel, and this was last year, I spent about eight months there, pretty much walking around looking for monkeys. Um, and most of the time, it's very rare to be above the canopy. Most of the time, even if you're on a hilltop, you're below 40, 50 meters. <laughs> it was really nice when you actually were able to see the habitat like, from above. What species was I looking at? Well, one of them is the Diana monkey. These are kind of fairly small monkeys. They weigh between three and a half and five kilos. Um, they, live, they have quite small home ranges. A home range is the area within which a group kind of lives, so how far do they move around for the central place? It's about a kilometer maximum, so quite a uh, kilometer squared. Um, they kind of, they don't do very well in disturbed habitat, so they tend to like primary habitat. This is mainly because they, they like being quite high up in the trees, and obviously if you have secondary forests, the trees are a lot smaller and not as high. Um, and as you can see, they can be quite expressive little guys. Um, the other species that I was focusing on is the lesser spot-nosed monkey, for obvious reasons, the name. Um, this is a bit smaller than the Diana monkey, um, similar home range, slightly less. Um, and these guys do better in disturbed habitat, so you can find them closer to villages, for example. And generally, you can find them lower down in the canopy as well as quite far high up. Again, quite expressive, quite expressive little guys. And how many monkeys did I see? So I spent eight months there. Um, well, as I was, well, these are, these are hunted uh, monkeys, so despite spending eight months there, it's very difficult to see lots of them. So what you find in brackets is 58 and 22, that's the number of groups. So a group could range from one individual to 30 plus, depending on the species. Um, and so each triangle is an independent group that I saw. And because I was saying in the previous slide about the home ranges, I can be fairly confident that they're different groups because they have quite a small, each group has quite a small area within which it stays. Uh, and my lines were spaced out over two kilometers apart. So obviously I can't be 100% sure that these are all different groups, but for the how I designed the kind of study, hopefully that is the case. And so what was I looking at whenever I saw a group of monkeys? Well, one of the things I was looking at is flight initiation distance. And that is the distance at which the monkey starts to flee at the approach of an observer. Basically, how close can I get before they run away? And there's a lot of work in birds that look at flight initiation distance. But yeah, the idea is that kind of gives you an indication of how scared they are of you. How close can I get before they run away? Do they perceive me as a threat? Um, yeah, so that's the flight initiation distance. And I recorded a lot of other behaviors as well. Their level of vocalization before they saw me and after they saw me. Often it was mainly after they saw me because they, they're very good at seeing me before. Um, but then how visible the monkeys are, whether they're hiding behind leaves or not, their group size, um, and how up in the trees they are, how high up they are, um, like whether they're like fairly close to the ground or up 20, uh, 40, 50 meters. Today I'm going to be telling you just about this, the flight initiation distance results. Um, and what I found was, so if you remember the previous map where I had the three different areas where you would expect different levels of hunting, well, what I found is that in the community forest, which is this area, the high here, both species run away at a larger distance. I couldn't get as close to them as compared to the Gola Rainforest National Park, which is the park in Sierra Leone that's been protected for quite a few years, and there I could get close, significantly closer both to them. Um, to point out that, so on the y-axis is the distance in meters. If you can see, even when I could get close, it was still about 30 meters. So these animals that are being hunted, they're generally kind of fearful of humans because although I can say, yes, there's lower hunting going on in the park in Sierra Leone, there's still hunting going on. And so from the monkey's perspective, they're never, you're never gonna be able to get that close. And this is the direct distance. So it's accounting for how high up in the trees they were. So it's not horizontal distance to the tree, it's the distance from me to wherever the monkeys were in the tree. Um, and so basically this is kind of a first indication the hunting does seem to be affecting not only the numbers, is what I was saying at the start, but also the behaviors of these, of these different species. And why is this important? Well, I'll come to the point why it's important in a second, but uh, to, to kind of explain what's important, I thought I'd come up with this little animation of what you want to do if you're a research scientist and you want to get an idea of those numbers. You want to know how much is hunting influencing these populations. What you'd do is you'd go to a specific area that you want to survey. You've had a bunch of lines, transect lines, 
and, you're, and the main method used is called kind of distance sampling. And basically, you walk these lines and you record all of the monkeys that you see, and then you know your, the area um, that you've sampled, and then you can kind of get an idea of, given all of these lines that I have, all of this area, what is the kind of bigger, the number for the whole forest? And, but what if they're in doing the same survey in an area where there's hunting going on? Well, what you would expect to see is some of those avoidance behaviors in action. So what you might expect to see is these monkeys are reacting you, to you more. So I'll play that again. Some of these are moving out of the way. So as a, as a researcher, you would count less individuals, which would give you an overall lower density estimate. You would get a lower count of monkeys in that area. Now, I'm not saying that hunting is an effective number. Of course it is. But accounting for this behavioral change might help us to get better, a better understanding and better idea of what numbers are actually there. Um, and what future directions, what I'm working on at the moment, I said I recorded other behavioral responses. So I recorded yeah, vocalization, group size. I'm interested in seeing how hunting pressure might relate to those. But also, I mean, just using level of enforcement, whether it's a park or not, how long it's been a park for, isn't a great, is not the best way to say, I can't, but that's where more hunting is going, happening compared to a different region. So what I've also been looking at at the moment is making different maps of hunting using different methods. So one method at the bottom is people have walked a bunch of lines in these forests looking for snares, which are traps that are used to hunt, to capture mainly ground mammals and empty gun shells. I'm trying to map this to get an idea of spatially within that same landscape where there might be more or less hunting pressure. It might be that actually, even if it's a national park, there's certain areas where there's actually quite a lot of hunting going on. And the other thing that I did is place these devices at the top. They're called audio They're recording devices across the forest and as many areas as I could. And what I'm working on at the moment, which is a really fun task, is going through these recordings, trying to find gunshots, so in a second, you will hear it. Yeah, so looking through the spectrograms, which are kind of the visual representation of sound, looking for these um, gunshots, um, and the idea is then I'll be able to make a map of hunting looking at gunshot frequency. Um, and then what I'll be interested in doing is looking back, relating that to these behaviors um, to have a look at that as well. And that's where I am at the moment. I would like to thank my supervisors, Sarah and Jay, everyone who helped me in country, um, so Michael, Anne, and Benji, all the organizations involved, the Gola Forest, the Society for Conservation of Nature in Liberia, RSBB, my university, Rolla Holloway. Actually, the Gola Forest has a sustainable um, uh, project on cocoa, and they've just released some chocolate bars in the UK that are sold in all our RSPB shops, so you should get some of those. <laughs> and then, finally, I'd like to thank my research team, without whom I couldn't have done any of the work I did. Thank you. Uh, great, yes, it's down. For, yeah, so I'm, I'm Joe Millard, I'm a PhD student at UCL. Um, my talk is going to be quite broad. I'm going to start off talking about the diversity of pollinators, um, and then I'll talk a bit about why pollinators are important. Um, and then towards the end, I'll come on to some of the threats to pollinators from human activities. And then I'll talk a bit about some of the research that I've been doing using data analytics to try and better understand how pollinators are responding to environmental change. So first off, what's pollination? Um, this is an apple tree, or more specifically, an apple blossom. Um, and in order for the, the apple tree to reproduce, it needs to, it needs to produce a fruit and a seed. And in order for that to happen, we need something called pollination to happen. And pollination is basically where pollen on the male structures of the plant, so these, these orange structures that you see in the middle of the flowers, it's when this pollen is transferred from the male structures to the female structures. Um, and in some, in some plants, the female structure will be nestled within the male structure of the plant, and, and in others, the female structure will be located on a different flower. Um, and in some species, in some flowering plants, this is, a, this is accomplished through wind or water. So, for example, in grasses, um, pollen is blown in the wind from one plant to another, causing, causing fertilization and the production of the fruit and seed. But in the case of the apple tree, and many others, this is actually accomplished through, by animals, such as the honeybee. So the honeybee visits the flower to feed on either nectar or pollen. And as the honeybee moves, or any other animal, moves from one flower to another, it transfers the pollen from one flower to the other, causing fertilization 
and the production of the fruit and seed. Um, and something like 87.5% 87, 87 of flowering plants are pollinated by animals in this way. So when people think of pollinators, they, they often think of two sorts of animals, especially in the UK. They'll think of the honeybees and the bumblebees. And, and I say plural because there are actually multiple of both of these sorts of species. There are multiple honeybees and multiple, bumblebee, multiple bumblebees. Um, honeybees are actually not native to large portions of their range. They evolved in Africa and then migrated up to regions of Europe and Asia, and were introduced by the Europeans something like 400, 500 years ago into the Americas. And at the time, this was, they were domesticated for, for producing honey that people eat. But as I'll talk about in a minute, actually honeybees have a much bigger value now in terms of pollination. Um, bumblebees, bumblebees are species of the northern hemisphere in cooler climates, hence the fluffy coats. Um, they're actually interesting in that they're important for something called buzz pollination. And buzz pollination is where the bumblebee lands on the flower and vibrates its wings at a particular frequency, which releases the pollen from the flower. And, and for some plants, this is actually it's essential for fruit. So for example, tomatoes, they require buzz pollination of something like, from animals like bumblebees. But actually then, if you look outside of the bees, the honeybees and the bumblebees even, the diversity of pollinators even within this clade is, is huge. So you can see here in red, these are the honeybees and bumblebees in a family that you call the Apidae. Family is just a, is a taxonomic level above the level of genus. But you can see here that there's actually six other families of bees. So you've got Melithidae, mason bees, mining bees. Not important the names really, but the thing to take away from this is that outside of the bees, there is a huge diversity of pollinators. Um, and then if you look outside the bees, the, the, the diversity of pollinators is quite staggering really. Insects are the most important contributors. Uh, butterflies, flies, and beetles, for example. Um, beetles are particularly interesting in that pollination first evolved in the beetles, but not actually in the flowering plants. It's, it's thought that pollination evolved first in the gymnosperms, so that's things like cycads and conifers. But then we also have vertebrate pollinators, so bats, hummingbirds, and even rodents. Um, they're actually in some parts of the world, such as southern Africa, which have evolved sort of peculiar reliances on rodent pollination. And it's thought that this is because uh, lower abundances of other sorts of pollinators means that strange things like rodents fill the gap. But rodents are weird, but they're not actually, in my opinion, the weirdest sort of pollinator. There's also underwater marine pollination. This is a seagrass. Um, it's a flowering plant that grows in the marine environment. And conventional wisdom would probably tell us that this is water pollinated. So the plant releases pollen into the water, and the currents in the water pull the pollen from one plant to another, which causes fertilization. But there are recent studies that actually indicate that crustaceans and other sorts of small invertebrate play a role as well. Crustaceans, in a similar way as other animals in the terrestrial environment, they visit the flower, they feed on pollen as they move from one flower to another. They inadvertently cause a transfer of pollen. Okay, so why, why study pollination? Why is all of this important? Well, many foods that we eat are pollinated by animals. In fact, all of these are pollinated by animals, with the exception of two, with the exception of bananas and grapes. <laughs> bananas are actually propagated from offshoots of older generations, so they're effectively clones. Grapes, similarly, can either be produced from offshoots of older generations or through self-pollination. So that's basically where the pollen moves within the same plant from the male structures to the female structures, um, not necessarily requiring the animal vector. Um, and all of this means that pollinations, uh, pollinators have an absolutely huge economic value to humans in the region of 230 to $410 billion per year, which is quite staggering. But unfortunately, there's a problem. So although pollinators are incredibly important to humans, our activities are unfortunately threatening their populations as well as the service that they provide. And that's for two primary reasons. There's land use change, so that's things like urbanization and agriculture, the way that we manage the land, and climate change, so the emission of greenhouse gases, which causes the climate to increase. 75%, at least 75% of the terrestrial surface on land has been modified by humans. Um, and again, as I said, this is in the form of urbanization and agriculture. And since 1880, average global temperatures have increased at 0.8 degrees Celsius per decade. And this is expected to continue to increase deep into the 21st century. And in terms of biodiversity as a whole, so across taxonomic groups, we have a reasonably good understanding of land use change and climate change effects on biodiversity. It gets a bit more complicated when you consider the way in which they interact. Um, and it also is, there's uncertainty as to the extent to which climate will increase over the 21st century, given that we don't really know how governments will react to these policies on reducing carbon emissions. But for pollinators, it's a little bit more complicated. And which brings us to the second problem, biases in data. Um, so actually, a lot of the models that have been built on pollinator decline are in these two groups that, we, that I mentioned earlier. They're in the honeybees and the bumblebees. And it's actually even worse than that, because 
they were not only just in the honeybees and the bumblebees, at, at least mostly. They were also primarily located in North America and Europe. Um, which brings me to the start of my PhD and some of the first problems I'm trying to address. I'm trying to understand what sort of data there is out there in the literature, um, whether there's extra information buried in the literature that we can be using to improve these biodiversity models that we use for pollinators in particular. Which brings me to Scopus. Scopus is a academic indexing website uh, where it indexes articles, lots of different academic texts. And what you do is you enter your search term and it gives you a bunch of literature relevant to that topic and you can filter for various different, different topics. So in the case of what I'm doing, I'm interested in pollination, so I use the term pollinate followed by an asterisk, which gives you any, just any extension on that word. And then in the case of what I'm doing, I'm filtering for English articles. I'll talk a little bit about why that's potentially a problem in a minute. Um, and primary research, because I'm just interested in the primary studies. And that gave me 30,546 results, which is, a, which is obviously a, a large amount. Um, a lot to be reading over the course of one PhD. Um, so what I'm then thinking about doing is whether there are text mining algorithms, so computer programs that I can use to extract the information more quickly from this, in, from this text, or at least prioritize those papers that are of interest. And to do that, I've been looking at two sorts of text mining algorithm. I've been looking at algorithms that extract species names, because one of the things I'm interested in is the distribution of the literature and pollination. And I'm also looking at algorithms that extract geographic locations. And by these geographic location algorithms, what I mean is they do two different things. The first thing it does is it identifies what it thinks is the main geographic focus for a chunk of text in the context of what I'm doing, that's abstracts. And they also pick out any geographic mention um, so not necessarily the, the focus of the study. And with these two things, so the taxonomic extraction and the geographic extraction, I want to ask this question. Which animals do we study in the pollination literature and where? Um, so these are my, some of my initial results. Uh, on the y-axis here, you can see the study number, which in this case is the number of abstracts. And on the x-axis, this is the taxonomic group, which in this case is the order. And as you can see here, the Hymenoptera are far and away the most studied of the pollination literature. Um, by Hymenoptera, that includes the ants, bees, and the wasps, which isn't surprising, given what we've talked and spoke about before with honeybees and bumblebees being some of the main studying groups. And then in second and third, these are the Lepidoptera and the Dipterans. Lepidoptera, that's things like butterflies and moths. Diptera, that's your flies. We've also got two bird orders here, which appear in the top eight. Uh, those are the Epodiformes, so that includes things like the hummingbirds. The Passeriformes, this is a much broader group, but it includes things like the sunbirds, which are nectar feeders. And we've also got bats in here, which is one of the ones that we mentioned as being important pollinators. And then the two other insect orders, the Hemipterans and the Coleopterans, which are also, so in those cases, those are bugs and beetles, which are important pollinators. If we drill down a little bit to a slightly lower taxonomic level, this is the level of genus. So this is one level below the level of family. We can see Apis and Bombus. This is the honeybee and the bumblebee, which unsurprisingly, comes out as one of the, as the top two. But we've also got the Manduka, which is a moth, a Lepidopteran, and Glossophagia. Glossophagia is a nectar-feeding bat. So, so the Glossophagia is one of the highest um, uh, studies in terms of pollination-related information. Um, but the thing to take away from this is that, yes, a lot of the pollination-related information does appear to be in Apis and Bombus, but potentially there is other information in other taxonomic orders and taxonomic genera. So what I'm now doing as part of my PhD is I'm going to some of these papers that I've prioritized, and I'm seeing whether there's anything valuable there that we can be using to improve our biodiversity models. So the second thing is where. So if you remember what I was saying a minute ago, the geographic location algorithm does two things. It looks as an, uh, an abstract, and it uh, tries to identify what it thinks is the main geographic focus for a chunk of text, and it also picks out any incidental mentions, so any other geographic mention in the text. And what I've then done is from those, the, uh, the overall geographic focus for a given abstract, I count the number of times that that country appears, and then I divide it by the area of that country, which gives me the study density. But because it's very skewed, so islands tend to have a very high study density, and then take the log of that. So these values that you see here are the log of study density for per, per kilometer squared. And a few things to pick out from this is that, yes, North America and Europe do have very high study densities, and that's not surprising. But there's also a couple of other interesting things here. Africa, there are huge gaps in our knowledge on pollination, with the exception of places like South Africa, Kenya, and Ghana. Um, South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, around here. And there also appears to be a big gap in Russia up here. 
which to some extent, as I mentioned earlier, the papers that I've been using are English articles, so it might be that there's some sort of effect here of, of uh, the sort of language that I'm using, but I've t attempted to ground truth some of these analyses by looking at similar sorts of studies that people have done on the distribution of ecological fieldwork, which also seems to show this similar sort of gap in Russia. A few other things to point out. There's actually, as, as you can see here, quite a high study distribution in Brazil in parts of the densely populated regions of Rio and Sao Paulo state down here, and also in northern India, which is a quite heavily agricultural region. So again, I think the takeaway message from this is that yes, there is a high study distribution in Europe and North America. There is potentially information in other parts of the world that we can extract to improve these biodiversity models. So again, in the context of this, as in the previous one, I'm going to these studies and trying to pull out some of the information to improve these models. Okay then, so just to finish off, um, what's the message in terms of all of this work about pollinators that I've been discussing? I think it's three things. Firstly, pollinators are hugely diverse and absolutely fascinating to study. Uh, secondly, pollinators are incredibly important for many of the foods that we eat, with the exception of bananas and grapes. And thirdly, pollinators are increasingly threatened by our activities, things like land use change, climate change, and we don't yet have a full understanding of how this is going to change into the 21st century. But the important thing is that biases in data make building these models for pollinators particularly quite difficult. So lastly then, I'd just like to say a big thanks to my supervisors, that's Tim Newbold at UCL, Robin Freeman at UCL and London Zoo, and Richard Gregory at the RSPB and UCL, as well as my funders, NERC and the RSPB. And thanks very much for listening. Has anyone got any questions? Um, so, uh, just to recap, I'm Alex, Naturalist Museum, Royal Holloway. Some images are graphic. <laughs> um, so, I'm uh, going to start by talking about uh, plastics in general, so large items, and then briefly talk about microplastics, and then go to explain you know, a couple of the sources that, or potential sources of these plastics, what ingests them, and then what I'm doing now, which is how these might move through the food web. I obviously don't really need to tell you that plastic is a really big issue. I think you're all familiar. I think now that David Attenborough said it, you've all heard of plastics and the negative issues it's had. You've probably all seen Im images uh, like these. I mean, I think this albatross image uh, at the bottom here is probably one of the most circulated images around plastic pollution. But people are starting to hear about microplastics, maybe slightly less than they've heard about these really big and obvious uh, plastics, such as fishing nets. Um, but it's, you know, for the general public, they're not always sure what that is. Uh, is it something that's microscopic? Uh, in fact, the definition is just anything less than five millimeters. So to give you a visualization for that, that's anything smaller than a grain of rice. So this piece of plastic here is about three millimeters, so still quite large in terms of, it's not micro, but you know, these uh, plastics are incredibly abundant. They were first reported in the 1970s in the marine environment. And since then, evidence for their distribution, negative impacts, and you know, ingestion has just grown exponentially year on year. So far, we have evidence for over 200 species ingesting microplastics. This is across pretty much every animal taxa, you know, terrestrial, marine. But this is only the ones we have evidence for. Probably a much higher number of species are ingesting plastic. It's just that we haven't proven it yet. So we kind of ask, what effect does it have? Obviously, with the images you saw initially, macroplastics have a very obvious negative effect. But are animals ingesting macroplastics having negative effects? Is it going to affect the way that they live? Once ingested, they can cause irritation. So they can cause scratches or blockages in the digestive tract. Um, but it really depends on the animals that are eating them. A couple of uh, lesser obvious, uh, less obvious reasons that plastics are quite bad is that they can transport invasive species and disease. So obviously provide uh, unprotected species with a, a new disease that they can't defend against. And also they contain and collect chemicals. So they absorb pollutants in the water, contain plasticizers, and all of these can be cancerous or endocrine disrupting. And while animals are healing the cellular damage, it means they have less energy for things like reproduction or foraging. 
we all know it's a global problem. Uh, we've probably all heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and that's uh, this one here. So these are the five gyres in the ocean, so areas where water current collects macroplastics that break down into microplastics. They're really heavy sort of soups of contamination, but I also want to point out that it's not just a global problem, it's a local problem. Uh, you've probably all seen of the Thames, or at least very familiar with the Thames, um, and that's one of my main sample sites. For me, it started with my supervisors, who weren't researching plastic, but were researching this individual, or this species, which is the Chinese mitten crab. It's an invasive species that's causing a lot of destruction in the Thames. It's called a mitten crab because it has these furry claws, a bit like cheerleader pom-poms. Uh, and to try and find if they could catch these and you know, not catch endangered species such as eels, they tested different nets. So these are fike nets. They sit about knee high off the riverbed. Oh, sorry, on the riverbed. Um, and they were testing whether they could catch fish and uh, not catch eels, but catch crabs as well. But what they were catching, as well as all of these animals, was plastic litter or litter in general. So over three months, eight and a half thousand pieces of litter were collected in these nets. So quite a staggering amount of litter that was unseen, hidden on the riverbed, that people didn't know was there initially. Quite recognisable items were recovered, so you can really identify these to source. You can say, you know, cigarette wrappers, uh, food packaging, sanitary products, you know, things that you can recognise quite easily. But there's also a lot of microplastics on the Thames. So I've got a couple of boxes here. Um, you won't be able to see them now, but after the talk, if anybody wants to have a really close look at some disgusting stuff I pulled off the riverbed, uh, you're more than welcome to come and have a guess at what these microplastics could be. Um, so you can see just from this picture here how diverse the amount or type and colour and shape of plastic is and how it can be quite difficult to say what, as a microplastic, that is. So I've got a couple of common examples for where a lot of this pollution is coming from. So if we look at polyester, which is one of the most abundant plastics we recover, fibres of polyester are found in clothing. Um, luckily today I'm wearing a cotton t-shirt, but um, you know, polyester, nylon, they're all very abundant in your clothes, and every time you wash them, thousands of fibres are being released. I mean, just sitting here as you're moving about, you're shedding lots of fibres. And another uh, source of polyester is wet wipes. So uh, people flush these down the toilet. Um, if it says it's flushable, it doesn't necessarily mean it's biodegradable. Similarly, uh, people flush sanitary products, as you saw earlier. These are made of usually a semi-synthetic material, but to make sure that they're stronger, they contain polyester fibers as well, uh, polypropylene fibers, sorry, as well. As a kind of side step into what you can do about this, um, if we look at the flushable items, the answer is only flush what should go down the toilet. So easy way to remember that is the three Ps. So only flush paper, poo, and pee. If it's not that, it probably shouldn't go down the toilet. Um, and if you're washing your clothes, only wash what you need to. If it's not dirty, don't wash it. Make sure you only do four washes to reduce the likelihood of just chucking something in because you're doing a wash anyway. And there's a couple of products you can buy which catch fibres in the wash, and so you can just dispose of them afterwards. But if we get back to how I got into plastics, with all the litter that my supervisors recovered from the bottom of the Thames, it led to many people asking, is anything ingesting it? Is anything eating this plastic? So as an undergraduate, I did a very small study looking at just two species of fish and found that, yes, both of these species were eating plastics up to 75% of a flatfish, a bottom-dwelling uh, species, had ingested plastic. And obviously that's you know, shocking. Such a huge proportion of fish in the Thames potentially contaminated. So I wanted to know, is it just the Thames, and is it just this species of fish? To answer that question, I looked at two rivers. So again, I continued to work in the Thames, knowing that there would definitely be contamination there but also looked at the Firth of Clyde. So the Clyde also passes through a big uh, major city, so it passes through Glasgow. Um, and to give you an idea of where my sample sites in the Thames are, this is you, this is the main society right here. So you can see all of these sites, uh, these three sites in the Thames here are downstream of London. So potentially everything that we flush or produce in, the, in London is gonna wash down to these sites. Overall, we looked at 760 fish and over 100 and, uh, 116 shrimp. To remove the plastics, it was just a case of visual examination, so sorting through the material and removing things that visually looked like plastic. These are categorised by their shape, their colour, 
and then we could identify what material they were made of. So to give you an idea of some of the plastic we recover, the most common shapes are fibres, but you've also got films, uh, which are flat pieces of plastic, fragments of irregular 3D shapes, and obviously beads such as things you'd find in cosmetics. Out of the 20 species of fish that we looked at, 13 had ingested plastic, and across both sites, that's over a third of fish to ingest plastic. We also found that shrimp ingested plastic, but only that 6% had. And as you can see from this bottom image down here, shrimp are not only ingesting plastic, and fish aren't just in ingesting plastic, but fish are ingesting shrimp. So potentially, they're ingesting contaminated food sources, but I'll get onto that a bit later. Overall, we recovered over 1,000 pieces of plastic from these animals, and over 80% of these were fibres, which is, highlights the importance of washing machines and other sources of these fibres, as I mentioned earlier. So if we look at the two sites, we find that on average, the amount of plastic in fish was the same between the two sites, but a much higher proportion of fish from the Clyde ingested plastic, which is quite shocking, considering how much we found in the Thames initially. So my question was, is the Thames dirtier? But now, is the Clyde dirtier? And in fact, it's probably not necessarily dirtier. Um, plastics don't retain in the gut of fish as they do in seabirds. So it could be that fish had just, uh, just ingested plastic or only just eaten plastic. And equally, the two estuaries are slightly different in their geography. So the, the Thames estuary is a, a floodplain estuary. It's quite fast flowing. Whereas the Clyde, where we're sampling, is a much slower flow, so there's more chance for plastic to you know, settle in the sediment. And also it's fjordic, so it has these deep ridges in the sediment, which could increase the retention time. So not necessarily dirtier, but maybe contains the plastic for longer. Again, water flow is really important. <coughs> Sorry. So we know that plastic is more abundant near urban centres, so we know that near London there will be a lot of pollution. But we also know that plastics flow out to sea. When we look at the sites from upstream to downstream, we find that it's not actually accumulating more near the sea or more near the urban centre, but in fact in this... Thank you. <laughs> more in this middle site. So Erif, this site that's sort of in the middle of the two, is actually situated on a bend in the estuary and it comes back to this water, uh, water flow. Where the, water is, uh, where the river is bending, the flow is much slower, and therefore more can settle, and it's easier for animals to ingest it. Equally, the Thames is tidal, which means that plastic isn't simply flowing straight out to sea. There will be moments when it's being washed back in. So now onto what I'm doing uh, at present as part of my PhD. So I want to look at transfer of plastics. Is plastic moving? from shrimp to fish, and from fish to large predators such as seals. So we've been very lucky at the museum, I say lucky, lucky for me, not for the seals, um, to have two stranded individuals that we were able to perform necropsies on. So I have a short video of some of uh, the necropsy process. So this is just uh, the beginning, we don't cut it open yet, so you won't see any of the gory insides. As you can see, there's quite a lot of us working here. So at the museum, we have quite a big team. We've got me looking at plastics, we have a parasitologist, and we also have a team looking at the anatomy of the seal. So I can well and truly say none of this seal goes to waste, and it's fully used for so much really interesting research. Unfortunately, we don't have any results yet. But we are still looking into that and analysing it. We can say that no large items of plastic were ingested. Um, but whether microplastics are ingested is still up for, de sorry, up for debate. Uh, there was a paper published yesterday that showed in 50 uh, marine mammals across 10 species, every individual in the UK had ingested plastic. So I'm probably the only person in this room that is wishing this seal has and kind of hoping that it follows the same trend. So I want to thank you for listening and for all the uh, supporting bodies for this research. Uh, if anybody has any questions about plastics in general or specifically about what I do, I'd happily answer them. Hi everyone, welcome back. 
Um, I hope you've enjoyed the day as much as I have. I've been an interesting range of talks and I've loved every, every single one. Um, so Joe is now busy telling up the results um, and I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Mike Benton to give our plenary talk. So Mike is Professor of Vertebrate Paleontology at the University of Bristol and is founder of the MSc in Paleobiology, which so far has hosted over 400 students. Mike works on macroevolution, drivers of evolution, mass extinctions, and dinosaurs and their relatives. He is the author of several paleontology books, textbooks, and children's books, and has advised on many media productions, including BBC's Walking with Dinosaurs, and was also a program consultant for Paleo World on the Discovery Science. He was elected Fellow of the Royal Society in 2014, and is also a Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and a Fellow of the Linnaean Society. So let's give a warm welcome to Mike, who will be discussing the origin of feathers. Thank you. Thanks very much, Leanne. Thank you for staying. I think they've organized the prize giving for after my talk to make sure that you stay. Um, so whether you liked it or not, you have to listen and you can't vote. Um, so when we think about birds, they are um, a fantastically successful group of organisms, however you define the term success. Not least in the fact that there are 10,000 species, they, they seem to do a great range of things, you find them all over the world, and they become a kind of um, textbook example of an adaptive radiation or a diversification and we often explain their success by uh, using a term like innovation or, or a, a key adaptation or terms like that. And obviously amongst these innovations are feathers, but also we could talk about flight and, and, and the, the lightweight skeleton, the highly efficient physiology, all kinds of features. So there are at least 30 innovations in that package of a bird that enables it to be a bird. Um, and some of you will know the history of this, and I'm not going to go into that at all here, um, but the, 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 they're still up there as a big debate uh, uh, theme or a big core theme in sort of basic evolution because uh, uh, at one time it was thought that this package of uh, biology emerged almost overnight. People would talk about a bird hatching from a crocodile egg. And if you look at creationist websites, of course, it's still up there for that reason. But I think most of you know the answer to that question, which is that, in fact, the, this package of innovations didn't emerge instantly in, uh, in one go, but, in fact, did occur in a stepwise manner. I'm going to concentrate, though, here on feathers. But before doing that, I just want to remind you of um, the, 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 the ways we use the, the term homology. Again, this is a very fundamental term. It was invented before Darwin, and, and uh, in the 1820s and 1830s, uh, people would assess homology in, in a non-systematic way, non-cladistic non way, but in terms of um, fundamental structure and observations of development. And those famous images of the rows of embryos and how similar they are at an early stage and so on, they come from before Darwin. And then, of course, Darwin gave an evolutionary explanation. And then, of course, we can add on to that subsequently uh, the genomic uh, uh, evidence about shared, uh, uh, shared pathways and so on. But there's a second kind of homology, and, and this is, or, or an expansion of the term. And, and this is well known to uh, uh, any, anybody educated in modern biology. But a lot of people in my field, paleontology, are not aware of this, or not so aware of it. And so we would often give an example uh, in first year teaching if we're trying to explain the term homology. We might say that the, 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 the wing of a bird and the wing of a bat are not homologies because they're constructed fundamentally differently, or the wing of an insect and, and so on. They're analogies, they're not homologies. And another example we would often give, of course, is the human eye, the cephalopod eye, the arthropod eye. And we might say, well, the eye of the octopus looks very like a human eye, but actually it must have evolved entirely independently. But then again, now we know, of course, that they are all kicked off by the same genome regulatory system. So the Pax6 uh, gene is there at the beginning of uh, the formation of eye spots and, and the triggering of uh, eye formation. And even in arthropods, which have such uh, uh, physically different structures of eyes functioning in such a different way. Nonetheless, this is what some people would call deep homology. 
And the, most, the best known example, of course, are the Hox genes, and, and this kind of diagram is, is very well known, where you can map uh, the, 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 the particular Hox genes uh, along the uh, length of the body and, and between the, the, the vertebrate and the arthropod, and the determination of anterior and posterior, the formation of limbs, as well as eyes, of course, all these other things. So that's quite well known. And therefore, linking this through to paleontology, these um, Hox genes must have originated 600 or so million years ago, and the formation of the body of every animal is somehow linked uh, in, in this way. But what about feathers? And what I'm doing here is sort of softening you up to accept what I'm going to say later on, um, which is somewhat controversial, but we're, we're, it'll seem rather obvious to you, I expect, because, because you know more about biology than many paleontologists. So this kind of diagram is also a very familiar uh, one from textbooks, which is based on um, the sequence of development of feathers in, in chick embryos, but also trying to make a, a, a kind of evolutionary prediction. So this was uh, uh, pretty much known to the Victorians, but it was particularly uh, pointed out by Ri Richard Prum uh, in 1999 in a series of other papers where before the discovery of the remarkable fossils from China, he more or less gave this kind of sequence, which is in very simplified form, his, his slightly more complex, but showing some sort of linkage from the simplest of feathers, which is little more than a bristle, through down feathers and, and contour feathers, which, which have barbs but no barbules, so they don't have the kind of interlocking structures, and then, then of course, the more complex uh, kinds of uh, penaceous feathers uh, used in flight and so on. Um, and then since that publication, paleontologists have been interested in what he did because we're finding fossils and do they support this or suggest something different? And on the other hand, um, uh, discoveries of genome regulation are uh, allowing people to map out pathways of, of triggering and suppression and so on in the production of feathers. So the fossils, in, in a very simple way, very quickly in the 1990s, um, confirmed that feathers did not originate with birds. So here is Archaeopteryx, the, 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 the very famous uh, uh, fossil found around 1860, and seen as a great vindication of Darwin within a year of publication of On the Origin of Species. Um, and all these above it, of course, are birds, and some, like Confucius Ornus, have come from China, uh, and they've filled in our understanding of the earliest birds, and, and often with specimens of really uh, astonishing quality. But uh, at first, very surprisingly, as people started looking at these little dinosaurs, which are below Archaeopteryx in the tree. So traditionally, we would call birds everything from Archaeopteryx and up, and these are theropod dinosaurs. And a lot of these little dinosaurs evidently had feathers. And I can remember when the first ones were uh, published in the, in, in the mid-1990s, people didn't believe it. They, they said either these are birds that m mistakenly look like dinosaurs or some cheeky person has been gluing feathers onto dinosaur skeletons or something. But nonetheless, they are fully accepted, and it's worth reminding you that not only are there 10 or 12 specimens of Archaeopteryx, there are about 10,000 specimens, 10,000 specimens, of these feathered uh, uh, dinosaurs. So these are not trivial or rare or easily fakeable specimens. And I think that kind of argument has gone away. But this shows us pretty much then that feathers clearly didn't originate for flight. That came later, aerodynamic function. It's always been assumed that feathers originated for insulation. They're connected with endothermy and the kind of high rate physiology of birds, but also now mapped onto these various dinosaurs which had them. But in addition, we would argue that perhaps feathers had a very important display function before flight. So I'll come to that a little bit later on. How good can these fossils be if you're not familiar with them, if you've not seen examples? So this is uh, 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 from a paper in Current Biology in 2017. They can be as good as that. Just have a look. So you can crank up the magnification. This is a mid-Cretaceous uh, tail of a dinosaur. Um, uh, and this headline, Dinosaur in Amber, that's the sort of dream of any fossil-mad person. So I was delighted to be involved in that. 
Um, and, and here it is. This is the little tail. Um, I think there's an ant there just for scale, so that would be about a centimeter long. So this is clearly the tail of a small dinosaur. But when we CT scanned it, you could see the, uh, the line of caudal vertebrae down the middle of that. And you could see the dried muscles and the skin. So it's all there. And then on the surface, <coughs> on the surface, there's thick covering of feathers. And when you crank up the magnification, you can see these tail feathers uh, have the, the, the detail of the barbs and everything is there. Um, so I can assure you the fossils are pretty good. Now, in terms of development, while, while fossil discoveries have been piling up and our understanding from the side of fossils has been improving, at the same time, our understanding of the genomic regulation of feather production has also been cranking up and improving. And there was a wonderful review by Danielle Duaili, uh, oddly enough, in a journal called Experimental Pet Dermatology, which perhaps one or two of you don't read every month. Um, and it's a pity it was buried in there because it's such a good review. And these figures from her work are, are really very helpful. And she was looking at two things. One was the broader uh, homologies, deep homologies, of all of these structures relating to feathers. And then secondly, in a little bit more detail, the different stages of feather development. And so at the, at the broader scale, this uh, phylogeny covers fishes and tetrapods, and birds with their feathers are over here. But without looking at the detail, it's just important to, to note that it is now well understood that these standard pathways uh, generate all of these dermal structures. So the denticles of sharks and scales of um, bony fishes, various glands and skin structures in amphibians, and very importantly, reptile scales, bird feathers, and of course, hairs of mammals. So again, we would say mammal hairs and bird feathers are clearly independent of each other. They, they have certain unique uh, characters. But morphologically, they share a lot, and I won't go into the detail there. But the genomic regulation is, of course, shared as well. And so Daniela Duaili's point would be that all of these structures, they're patterned within the skin. They have that shared property of, of emerging from patterned structures within the skin of the early developing embryo. And depending on subtle variation in the, the, the genomic regulation, you can get this great variety of structures. And secondly, you can switch them off. And so this was a, a important for what I'm going to talk about a little bit later from the fossils, is that in many cases, the absence of feathers can be due to suppression. In other words, the primary uh, ex expectation, what she calls the ectodermal default competence, meaning if nothing else intervenes, um, the, the wind and the sonic hedgehog will give you feathers if you're a bird or will give you hairs if you're a mammal, or will give you scales if you're a fish or a reptile. And in order to switch it off, in other words, in your mouth, eye, and, and the soles of your feet and, and palms of your hands, the, the production of hair or feathers or scales is switched off by additional genomic uh, intervention. So that's important to keep in mind, which seems sort of obvious. But again, we've had, we've had sort of debates with paleontologists who don't quite get that. Um, and then the final uh, image from that review paper that I mentioned, um, it, it takes it right back to the fundamentals. Why are all these structures which look rather different? And to biologists, they've always been described as non-homologous or somehow only faintly related in evolution. It's because of this primary regular patterning of placodes in the early developing um, ectoderm of all of the, the embryos of all of these. And these regularly occurring structures can either sprout as hairs or certain kinds of glands or scales or feathers or whatever. So that's, the, that's what's understood to be the sort of fundamental homologous aspect. And then it, these different structures become fixed within the different major groups of, of vertebrates. So bearing all of that in mind, and I expect a lot of you know this anyway, forgive me this is the, if, if that's the case, Let's have a look at paleontology. And, and one or two of you might agree with this whiskery man uh, who said um, that uh, physics is the only real science, as one person in the room might agree with that. Um, and all that is not physics is merely stamp collecting. Now, I'm, I'm, holding, I'm holding Rutherford up a little bit unfairly, because what he actually meant was that 
physics and mathematics, uh, you, if you study those, you have the opportunity to discover general rules or laws of nature, whereas in the others you don't. But it does sound a little bit disparaging, what we all do, actually, is mere stamp collecting. But in the field of paleontology, we're quite exposed to, to that kind of steely-eyed criticism. And we could ask this question at the bottom, and I'll, I'll attempt to answer it. Paleontologists, of course, have empirical evidence. We, we not only have shells and skeletons and, and stuff and dinosaurs in amber, um, but we also have footprints uh, and, and like that, which um, are preserved as beautifully as if they'd been made yesterday. And so that's actually showing you what was happening on a particular day, single day, uh, 200 million years ago. It's just all there. Uh, but also, you can sometimes, if you're lucky, find ecological interactions. Fish A eats fish B, uh, or fossil poop. And you can CT scan that, or, or, or dissect it, and find out what's inside, all that kind of stuff. So I think that's not unexpected. But we have a couple of other tools in our armory, which um, I, I'm going to tell you about, which maybe you sort of know, but you sort of don't know. Obviously, we, we compare things with modern analogs, but how do you choose those modern analogs? And I think until recently, that was a bit ill-defined, and, and that was a weakness of our science. But we now try to focus on the extant phylogenetic bracket, which is one of those things which is extremely bloody obvious, but has to be defined and clarified just to make it clear. So we know, for example, that mammals and reptiles and birds all lay the same kind of amniotic egg. It is clearly homologous between them. It's complex and all the details are the same. And yet, the oldest fossil eggs that we know are, are, are from the Triassic. So the oldest fossil eggs are about 200 million years ago. But we can say with some confidence that the common ancestor of all three of these also laid an amniotic egg because we're using a basic cladistic principle. That's all it is. It seems extremely bloody obvious, and of course it is. But this is also what allows us then, if we can include fossil forms, so where do dinosaurs fit? They'd fit in about here. And so anything that turtles have and birds have, or crocodiles, whatever, anything that turtles or crocodiles have and that birds have, dinosaurs must have. Except you're jumping to the obvious caveat, which is, unless they lost it. But let's assuming they don't lose it. That's how we can tell a lot about the eyeball of T-Rex, even though we will never find a fossilized T-Rex eyeball. Because the fundamental structure of the eyeball of all vertebrates is the same, and therefore it would be bizarre to assume that T-Rex would somehow totally evolve something different. So that's important, extant phylogenetic bracket. is a powerful tool for a kind of geometric inference of, of possession or absence of certain features that may not be preserved in the fossils. We also have, as, as, a, as a second scientific tool, something new, if you like, is multiple corroboration. Now, I'll explain this with a couple of examples. We want to look at these footprints, which you saw a second ago, and which this chap is contemplating. What speed was this dinosaur moving at? It starts off here. You can see the three-toed print. And this, this would be right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, all the way up there. I think you, you have an idea that the spacing of those footprints is proportional to the speed. OK? Kind of obvious. Uh, and that's been demonstrated. It's, it's one of those little classics of, of biomechanics or whatever. Uh, and this is an empirical formula, meaning that it's simply derived from observation watching animals running along, whether they're bipedal or quadrupedal, well, at least vertebrates. I don't know if it applies to insects, probably not. Um, so whether it's an ostrich or a human being or a horse or a mouse, this works. And therefore, the assumption is it'll work for fossil footprints as well. Why would it not? Um, and so we can calculate the, the, the speed. And of course, the, the measurable things are gravity, stride length, and height of the hip. So the only thing that isn't in front of you, well, we assume gravity in the Jurassic was the same as it is today. Stride length you can measure from the, the, the trackway. And uh, the height of the hip is proportional to the length of the foot, so you can derive that as well. Or if you're lucky, you may have associated skeletons that you can say, well, I'm pretty sure the foot skeleton of this dinosaur fits these prints, and I can use the skeleton to get the hip, height of the hip. 
And there's even a website you can put in your measurements and it'll give you the result. You can get at speed in a different way. And, and this is from a, a very famous painting by Lewis Ray. Um, and, and this was a speculation by John Hutchinson and colleagues. Uh, John is now at the Royal Veterinary College. Um, and he was trying to apply basics of anatomy and um, biomechanics and, and function learn from living animals to the fossils. And he was speculating, we know that chickens are good runners. You, you may not believe that. Has anybody here ever tried to catch a chicken? They are good runners. Um, they are well designed for running. Um, and his speculation is, what if you had a five-ton chicken, which is a T-Rex? Could it run as efficiently? I think you can probably work out from standard kinds of uh, uh, mass, volume, length types of measurements that it probably couldn't. Um, and the relationship is indeed exponential, that the heavier you get, the harder it is to run. And this plot gives you an estimate of, or measured from living organisms with the fossils shown here and there, um, of the mass of uh, the percentage of body mass devoted to leg muscles. And so it's based on a simple observation that um, if you've got massive leg muscles, you will run faster than if you've got rather weedy leg muscles. And we know that from looking at human athletes, for example. And this applies more generally. And, and the larger the mass, which is proportional to the diameter of the muscle, the, the greater the power. Um, and so Hutchinson and colleagues were able to plot uh, the chicken as a good runner, best running ability. At the lowest possible size of a T-Rex, it's, it's uncertain running. And the six-ton chicken right up here absolutely could not be a runner of any kind. So they were plodding along. And so they back-calculate the most likely running speed. This then is, and, and they agree with the trackways, so this then is mutual co corroboration coming from two different directions, which are largely independent of each other. Here's another quick example. We know that T-Rex could bite your head off. This is a normal-sized T-Rex with a normal-sized person behind, not an unusually small person. And so clearly T-Rex could bite your head off, swallow you. What was that bite force? So the first attack was using um, puncture marks on bones. And this photograph is of a, a part of the hip bone of a, 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 of, of a triceratops. And the mark in it, that gash, is made by a T-Rex tooth. I couldn't find a photo that showed it, but the investigators poured setting plastic into the gash, let it set, pulled it out, and they were holding a plastic T-Rex tooth because the shape of, and size of the tooth is very characteristic. So we know for a fact that at some point 67 million years ago, a T-Rex bit into that bone. It doesn't matter whether the Triceratops was dead or alive, the bone had the same material properties, whichever. And so knowing those facts, it was possible to model the material properties of the bone, they just use a bit of cow bone, and puncture it using a sort of press in the lab. And they were able to calculate that the bite force was um, 13,000 newtons on that day. And so I hope you can see the logic there. That's pretty testable and reasonable. And then secondly, using a totally different approach, people have applied um, various kinds of physical models using the digital 3D model, calculating stresses and strains, again, knowing the material properties, and estimating muscle positions and muscle, oops, muscle forces. And so this diagram shows uh, the skull, pieces of food in yellow, and the muscle, the vectors, the central vectors of the muscles in, in, in red. Um, and so they're able to calculate different bite forces here. So in fact, that T-Rex there was barely trying, because this is the true range of bite forces if it's really trying, and compare with the human and so on. So the, 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 the variation, and there is no doubt then that T-Rex had, had, had a, a powerful bite force. So again, a, a sort of mutual corroboration thing. And the final one I've already hinted at, and I'll just say in a sentence, which is that with CT scans of fossils, we can capture a 3D shape in great detail inside the computer. And then whatever it is, whether it's a T-Rex skull or a foram, we can put the material properties onto that 3D model and you can refine those into a network so that you can apply any number of different material properties 
to the different parts of the skull and to the teeth. And just in case you don't know, if you get broken dinosaur bones, you can see all the detail right down to the osteocyte lacunae. So the detail is all there. And then, of course, that's that thing you have in your computer, that 3D model of your trilobite or forearm skeleton or T-Rex skull, that's actually real. Think about it. That's real because it's, it, you know, a, a metal, a, a steel model or a plastic model or a wooden model of your fossil, that's pointless because it's got the wrong material properties. It may be the correct shape. Uh, and then Emily Rayfield, who's a professor in Bristol, um, she's particularly driven this technique uh, and applied it to dinosaurs, but also many other uh, uh, types of organisms. And uh, uh, she can test for stress and strain and, and, and other aspects of function. So I think I've outlined three perhaps unexpected ways that we think we know what we're talking about. Um, first of all is the extant phylogenetic bracket. Secondly is uh, multiple independent corroboration. And thirdly is this kind of um, 3D uh, material model approach. There we are. <clears throat> but what can we never know? And people have written books about this. What can we never know? And you're all still, don't write that book, because the minute it's published, people already will have discovered stuff that you said we'll never know. And I used to say, well, we'll never know the color of dinosaurs. But of course, the color of the fossils may not be the original color. That's, that's the point of this slide. Um, but I'm just going to show you briefly, we do know the color of dinosaurs, so that we can look at these two paintings of Sinosauropteryx, the same dinosaur from the early Cretaceous, 125 million years ago of China, and we can say, without a shadow of doubt, this is incorrect and this is correct. So that's a pretty sharp thing to say, um, but we would say so. And we've got a line of reasoning behind that, which I shall show you. So we, we did this uh, uh, in 2010. There were a couple of papers. Well, we did it actually two years earlier, but we had to fight the bloody referees. Um, nonetheless, our paper was published uh, there, and we were in the rather bland nature title. What we're actually saying is we've discovered the color of dinosaurs for the first time ever. Lo and behold, a month later, another paper comes out from a group at Yale, Jakob Winter. So we could have had a big fight, but we actually hired Jakob Winter to Bristol. So that's that, basically. <laughs> end, of, end of fight. Well, I hope so. And that caused a lot of excitement, as you can imagine. And these were the pictures, and some of you may remember them. Um, this, this is our dinosaur. This is the Yale dinosaur. And so this, this came from collaborations with colleagues in China. Beijing is here, and, and these amazing fossils come from Liaoning province, from the Jehol group of rocks aged at about 125 million years ago, early Cretaceous. And I'm just going to skip through these very quickly. So this is, this is the kind of excavation that uh, colleagues in China have done, sort of bed by bed. And this one locality at Sihitun has produced thousands of specimens, including a thousand of these early birds. So we used to get our knickers in a twist if somebody discovered another Archaeopteryx, and there's only 12 of them. <sighs> Thousands of these, and each one of these fossils is as good as uh, Archaeopteryx. And just ping through these. And, and the diversity of fossils is, is shown there, and, and this is a rather broken up example, but it's indicating that we're finding unusual things like seeds in the stomach area in, in the case of this one. And this would be a sort of very simplistic scene of all the animals crammed in together. We're, we're sampling in these ancient lake sediments uh, not only animals that live in the lakes, like fishes and crocodiles and such like, but also um, animals that live around the edges, like mammals and dinosaurs, and things that fly over the lakes, like the birds and the pterosaurs and the insects. And the dinosaurs are the, the, the key things to look at. Uh, the first feathered dinosaur to be published was indeed Sinosauropteryx, and this is the type specimen. Uh, and you can see, typically, it's complete. It's got a nice black eye spot, which is the melanin of the, uh, uh, of the retina. Um, and also, the, the, there's a sort of fuzz over the back, and then sort of tufts along the tail. And the reason we can see them is, of course, they're all rich in melanin. So that, that's, that's showing up in the fossil. Although the color of it, we, we just have to accept that sort of, oh dear, that sort of dull here we go. That sort of dull brown color is, is more fossil than, than original color, I, I would assume. 
and there's an early reconstruction. And this dinosaur, it was new, but it fits into the phylogeny. It's very close to Compsognathus, which comes from the same location as Archaeopteryx, so we know where it fits. And when it was published, people looked very hard at these fuzzy structures. Here's some of these. Oh, keep doing that. Here's some of these uh, tufts along the tail. You can see the sort of whiskery looking things. And the original authors were a little bit cautious and said, well, they, they, we'll call them proto feathers. They didn't exactly call them feathers. And others were saying, no, 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 you can't get a dinosaur with feathers. These must be something else like shredded skin or, or something uh, or whatever. I think they were muted somewhat a couple of years later when another feather dinosaur was published and it had evident, uh, it had um, uh, uh, sort of down feathers. And then a couple of years later, again, this astonishing creature, Microraptor, was published. And it's not a bird. It looks like a bird. It's even got wings on its hind legs. Here's the fossil. You can see the feathers, uh, the primary feathers extending back here, but also on the hind legs. Um, uh, but it, but it's, it's, it's a relative of Deinonychus. It's not a bird. You know, so from the skeleton, it's known where it fits in the, the phylogenetic tree. So I think most rational people have accepted that dinosaurs can have feathers. And you've seen that diagram already, and it does seem to roughly confirm the prum sequence of bristles to branched or simple down feathers through to penne or the, the, the sort of proper uh, sort of wing contour feather type structures. So it's more or less as predicted. So, so far, so good. And I'll just show a couple of the birds. Uh, you know, again, there are thousands of specimens. And if we think Archaeopteryx is amazing, have a look at that. Many of you will have seen this before. It's a couple of examples of Confucius Ornus. Uh, and it's very likely that this is the female and this is the male. And already this one is showing that it's got long pennant-like feathers. Uh, uh, and we would expect that they would have some quite bright colors, bars of black and white or something like that. We have to yet test it. There are large-ish birds. That thing is about the size of a pheasant. And, and tiny little birds the size of a wren. There are even birds in their eggs. So some of these fossils are just a a a amazing. And many of them contain additional uh, paleobiological information, such as stomach contents and crests. And, and so there's endless possibilities here to derive information about modes of life. Um, the color, identifying color, is because melanin is a tough pigment or a tough biomolecule. It survives. There's been a lot of study of this by geochemists, and, and they've accepted that we are finding truly uh, in the fossils, we're finding melanin. But in fact, we're not using the chemical test as the means of telling color. We're using ultrastructure, as I'll explain. So in humans and mammals and birds in general, there are often two kinds of melanin produced, um, there is, uh, which have different chemical structures. There's eumelanin, which is the one everybody has heard about, which gives black and brown colors and grays and, and blondes. And there's another kind called pheomelanin, which gives ginger. And so in mammals, including humans, those are the only colors that our hair can be. And also, of course, melanin occurs in the skin and, and, and inside the body, within the brain, and around the internal organs, and in the liver, spleen, many, many places. But we're just concerned here about its expression in epidermal structures. And so melanin gets into hair and feathers by means of um, the, the way it's produced in the skin, and then it's encapsulated. So melanocytes in your skin can produce both these kinds of melanin. So the same cell can produce both kinds. And before it, it, it goes into a, a, a hair or feather in the follicle at the very early stage of development, it's encapsulated within a melanosome. Uh, and and the, the, the chemical structure of the fundamental melanin pigment determines the shape of that melanosome, QED. That's how we do it in the fossils. In birds, of course, I'll show you the images in a moment. In birds, of course, they have additional uh, coloring agents such as carotenes and porphyrins. Uh, and also, they can um, have a number of uh, uh, nanostructural adaptations that can give um, iridescence. And so the blue color of a kingfisher, more or less, is just reflecting the sky. So if you think about it, it's just because of the arrangement of the melanosomes in the feathers. And so a common question we would ask our students is, what color is a kingfisher at night? Think about it. 
So melanosomes and color. Um, we looked at feathers of a zebra finch, and zebra finches have both pigments. So all of the grays and blacks and browns are from eumelanin, and this uh, ginger patch on the cheek is from pheomelanin. And a single feather can span both. So we took a feather here that's got black and, and, and ginger, and then it's going into this white patch, and you've got white patches. And you find in the black area, you find sausage-shaped eumelanosomes. In the ginger area, you find spherical uh, pheomelanosomes. And in the white area, you find nothing. That is the native color of the keratin of the feather, transparent, in other words. Uh, and that's a better image showing uh, the, the shapes of these uh, melanosomes, the spherical uh, 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 pheomelanosomes, the sausage-shaped um, eumelanosomes. And I won't explain this in huge detail. This had already been set up by Jakob Winter a couple of years earlier, where he had shown in a very well-preserved feather from Brazil that in the dark areas, you get eumelanosomes. In the white areas or the transparent areas, you get nothing. You're just looking at rock. And so the reason that feathers are commonly preserved is because they contain melanin. And many of you will know that, that if you look at typical seabirds, for example, which tend to be white, for reasons of um, reflections from the surface of the ocean and so on, they often just have a black tip to the feathers for protection because that just toughens up the tips of the feathers. The point about Winter was, though, he made a very clear case that these sausage-shaped structures are not coccoid bacteria, as people had said before, reflecting some taphonomic preservation process. They are fundamental and they are within the structure of the feather. They're not scattered as a kind of microbial film, which would have covered the whole feather, whether dark or pale. And so here's our fossil. There's a close-up of the feathers. There's the image of the uh, melanosomes in the fossil, magnified almost to the limit of the SEM. And so that's all we found. We looked at many parts of the um, feathers from many parts of the body, all pheomelanosomes, all ginger. Hence, there's our reasoning. And we looked in the pale areas between the tufts, and there was nothing at all, which is why we then reconstruct with uh, ginger and white stripes along the tail. And so we would say, that's it. That's it. Um, find another specimen. Have a look. See what you find. I expect that people will find the same thing if they have a look at other specimens. Although I have to say, there are only four specimens of these in existence. So when we approach the curator carrying our scalpel, because you have to flick off little bits of the fossil to put them under the SEM. Uh, they, they, they get a little bit green around the gills. Um, but there we are. And, and, so, and that was the same logic that, that uh, Vinter and his people did, used on their dinosaur as well. Now, subsequently, so feathers in, in theropod dinosaurs. Subsequently, feathers have been reported in other groups of dinosaurs. So we're kind of broadening their uh, occurrence. So a few years ago, we were working with colleagues from Belgium and Russia on specimens uh, of this little dinosaur, which is a herbivorous dinosaur, quite a long way from birds in the, the family tree. Uh, and, and we found all over the surface these strange, regularly arranged, sort of scale, whiskery scale type structures all over the body. Uh, and in some areas, like on the tail and on the limbs, we find large scales. So it's like a rat. You know, rats have got sort of big scales on their tail, which are kind of modified back from hairs. It, it, it's sort of all of these things, you can, you, you know, it's not a simple one-way evolution from scale to feather, scale to hair. It can go scale to hair to scale. And so some rodents and, and many birds, of course, have scales on certain parts of the anatomy, as does this dinosaur. Uh, and so we were able to map out all over the body all the detail. Another uh, related Ornithischian dinosaur is Cetacosaurus, which has this ludicrous kind of fence of uh, uh, big, stiff bristles along the middle of its back. Finally, pterosaurs. Um, for a long time, pterosaurs have been known to have some kind of uh, uh, epidermal structures. And they were called pycnofibers. Uh, and, and they've been known really since Victorian times. The fossils are often quite well preserved. And these, these are a fascinating group. Um, they are close relatives of dinosaurs. I'll show the, the tree in a moment. Um, but they've really interested people hugely because 
in Victorian times, people found Pteranodon, and that was thought to be pretty big. And then uh, in the 1970s, Quetzalcoatlus was found. And this is it, true to scale. So it's the height of a giraffe, and yet it has folded leathery wings and all the indications that it could fly. But how on earth could such a huge creature fly? So this is still a, an aerodynamic conundrum. Needless to say, it was found in Texas. So what about these pycnofibers? Um, here is the previous best study, if you like, or study of the hairiest of pterosaurs, Sordes pilosus, which means hairy devil. And this thing from the Jurassic of Russia, here it is, and, and close up of some of the hair-like structures. And when it was described, uh, care had to be taken. It was pointed out that there are actinofibrils. These are strengthening fibers in the wing. So you've got to be careful not to confuse the two. So you can have uh, hair-like structures which grow out of the skin and, and presumably are for some sort of insulation. But you can also have um, elongate structures, which in the fossils might look a bit hair-like, which are some kind of strengthening structure within the membrane of the wing. So this is our pterosaur. Um, uh, this is Quetzalcoatlus. Uh, this thing, I should really scale it. It, it would just sit on your hand. It's a, it's a very small creature. And uh, the, the, this is from our paper that was published a couple of weeks ago. And we photographed all over the, the, the body of these fossils. Here's the whole fossil. The head is up here, it's maybe not terribly clear. The foot, the wing is coming down here, the sort of wing membranes are here. And with colleagues in China, we worked all over the, the body looking for structures. And we were absolutely astonished that we did find monofilaments, which is what was expected. But then we found monofilaments that sort of tufted at the end. And then other ones that tufted part way along. And then other definite down feathers. And we're thinking, do, are these really feathers? Well, according to some dictionary definitions, it's a feather if it branches. It's a hair if it does not branch. And of course, mammal hairs don't branch. These do. So that was quite startling. And nonetheless, we rather, we, we, in the title, I, I, I was wanting to call it um, feathers, pterosaur feathers. But uh, my, my co-author said, no, 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 we'll call them integumentary structures. We'll have none of this trouble, troublemaking. Uh, but I did get in feather-like branching, so a feather-like, okay, you're not really saying they're feathers. And so here are the photos, here are the drawings, and, and we have, the claim of this paper then in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution was um, pterosaurs have four kinds of dermal structures, including three of which, which show branching. And by some definitions, you would then call them feathers. And so here is the, the beast as reconstructed. And, the, and, and I should say these pycnofibers, these feathers, contain melanosomes, as we'd expect. And this particular one was a sort of nice gingery brown color. Uh, and it's actually caused a little bit of public interest already, so even though it was only published. So uh, Oprah Winfrey is saying, you get feathers, meaning the, the bird-like dinosaurs, you get feathers, the ornithischians, you get feathers, the pterosaurs, everybody get feathers. So that's great, that's great, that's great. <clears throat> I like it. So we did a, a kind of macroevolutionary analysis in the paper, and I'll try to explain this. The geological time scale, um, oh, this isn't a great copy, it doesn't matter. Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and um, what we did was we, we recorded every species of dinosaur and pterosaur for which there is fossilized evidence of the dermal structure. And we were looking for scales, uh, as well as monofilaments and different kinds of feather-like structures, all the way through to these uh, contour-type penaceous feathers, which are, are, of course, characteristic of birds today. And birds are up here, aves, and of course, various groups of theropod dinosaurs show these, as we know, and Sinoceroptrix is somewhere in here. Uh, and then some dinosaur groups, like sauropods and ornithischians, don't have a great deal, but then there are some ornithischians that do, and of course, now pterosaurs, and we're homologizing the whole bloody lot. And, and then the probabilities of ancestry are, show, are calculated uh, in terms of trait evolution. I'll show this slightly simplified version, uh, and I've got the time scale correct on this one. And so what we are saying is, whereas up until uh, a couple of weeks ago, origin of feathers was somewhere in here, on the line to, uh, to birds, and that this happened somewhere in the middle Jurassic. We're now saying that pterosaurs also have feathers, so the origin of feathers shifts back to the beginning of the Triassic. 
And so that, that's quite a different, uh, it's not only taking it way back in time, and it gives us a different perspective on the combination of modern EVO-DEVO genomic data, which I think would be comfortable with this idea, but it rather revolutionizes our understanding of what is unique about birds, because of course this now takes the origin of unique bird innovations far deeper in time than anybody had imagined. Um, and secondly, it brings the origin of feathers into a very different time and place. So that this time in the early Triassic, uh, 250 million years ago, this was the time when life was recovering from the biggest mass extinction of all time at the end of the Permian. And 95% of species were killed off by that extinction. And life just retained its toehold, and both in the oceans and on land. The recovery of life at that time in the early and middle Triassic was a really dramatic time, and this was the origin of modern ecosystems, both in the oceans and on land. And so this brings the origin of feathers right to a, that time of recovery, when there is independent evidence amongst, uh, 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 among vertebrates for an enhancement of the pace of life. This was a big shift, and I think we can now solidify this argument. This is all new, that uh, on land, uh, there's independent evidence for a shift in posture all the groups of organisms went from sprawling, the larger ones, sprawling posture to upright posture. And the two main groups are synapsids and diapsids, ancestors of mammals, ancestors of birds. So the endothermy, the warm-bloodedness of mammals and birds tracks back, I'm arguing, to the early Triassic. And you have hair in mammals and in their ancestors back to that point. You have feathers in birds and their ancestors back to that point. That would make a few people scream. But uh, there's additional evidence then from the shift in posture because we have trackways that show that these large animals, which up till the end of the Permian had been sprawlers, suddenly become dainty and upright. And that gives them a greater opportunity for fast movement. Uh, secondly, the bone histology changes. And you can read from the cell structure of the bone of fossil organisms what their physiology was like. Thirdly, in certain groups, including the birds and the dinosaurs, certainly, possibly the pterosaurs, we know they had the one-way respiration system. So we can track that feature of birds, that efficient, they, they're so efficient at uptaking oxygen compared to mammals, that goes all the way back. And so a great deal is going on at that time. And so we're just arguing is what you'd expect. But I think that's quite new, and I, I expect we'll, we're still waiting for the backlash. We've had a tirade of emails. No, you've got it wrong. You, these are all actinofibrils. These are not feathers. What are you talking about? Um, but I think people will come around. I think they're, 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 they'll just grasp that, yeah, yeah, it's easier just to agree. And otherwise, I'll, <laughs> otherwise, I'll just keep bleating on about it until, the, until they accept it. And I'll finish with this. Um, I've written this up and other stuff. I've got a book coming out in a couple of months that you might be interested in, or maybe not. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
Thank you. say thank you again to Mike Benton for a fantastically feathery talk and a big thank you to our speakers and post presenters for participating in today's conference for our judges for having the hard chart um the, uh, oh my gosh what am I trying job. to that's it the hard job. The hard, yeah it's a long day um the hard job of making decisions today and thank you to our audience for being receptive and asking such great questions um, I just wanted to end today with a bit of a, another plug. Um, we have another day meeting coming up next month, which is the Linnaean Society Conference Diversity Within Natural History. So we're looking at the contributions of ethnic minorities to natural history. Please do book. Um, it'll be a great for you all your to attend. Um, so please join us for a drinks reception upstairs in the library. Um, and that's it for today. And can I just ask all speakers, post presenters, and judges to stay behind in the meeting room for some photos. But that's it. Thank you all again for coming and enjoy the drinks reception upstairs. Thank you. Thank you.